everybody, welcome back. It's what's the name of the show again? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like film, uh, movie talk, movie, m- movie nerds, dude. Movie nerds. Movie That's nerds. The name of the show. That we'll was almost the title. I don't yeah, think, right? dude. We actually don't have an never. almost title. Like film no. tangents came immediately. No, because I remember. I remember when we had this conversation. Because I think you and I always. I think you and I always had that kind of back and forth, where we would bring up the idea of doing something like this. Um, and I remember you were like, "I have a name," and you told me like film tangents, and I was like, "Well, that kind of seems like." The name. <laughs> yeah, that is. Yeah, it, it never. It never really came. It never. Nothing ever came after that <laughs> yeah dude well that's, that's just my creative excellence coming through yeah, dude. dude i remember that i remember that i, I was at like your house and i remember being like yeah this sounds like the name of the show yeah and thus it was born birthed from my my womb but uh we're back everybody no, no don't don't pat yourself too hard <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you like you like curled your lip a little bit when i said that <laughs> you look, like Ugh. um we're back everyone um we're one person away from a uh, from a uh, 300 spartans um that's subscribing right. to this right, podcast dude, dude. so um whoever's out there listening go make a fake youtube account subscribe so we get <laughs> to 300 plus um yeah uh that would be that would be cool if and when we get to 300 uh subscribers which again thanks guys for getting us to 299 um when we get to 300 we'll do a a a super spectacular 200 special subscriber thing meaning that we're not gonna do anything but right yeah (laughs) maybe when we get to like a thousand we'll do something yeah (laughs) but yeah give us some ideas too in the comments if you want like um for special episodes too i had an idea yeah. for i'll put it in our little notes thing i had an idea for uh which is pretty far out but you know our, our halloween special this year that we could do or a halloween yeah. special if you know we could do it too honestly but yeah um anyway yeah like subscribe um hit that bell icon comment something anything you know whatever and um, we were talking about comedy, dude. Yeah, but just to take, I guess to 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 take a second, um, I want to give I want to give a a rest in power, rest in peace. Oh yeah, to a beloved man um, with whom we've shared a lot of memories, a lot of time, and who with whom we've whose meals we've eaten. Um, this is a rest in peace to beloved um, chef from the School of the Arts. Um, Hector Lopez. Um, yeah. Rest in peace. Yeah. Yep. Hector Lopez. Um, rest in peace. He uh, passed away. I think this morning or last night. Um, but uh, he was, yeah, one of the chefs in the dining hall uh, of University of North Carolina School of the Arts, um, which is a college that uh, we attended for film and screenwriting. Um, and yeah, he was, uh, man, he was a great dude. Um, we obviously have a lot of great memories with that guy. Yeah, we have a lot, we have a lot of memories with that guy. Yeah, man. I mean, he made the, dude, he made the dining hall fun, man. He was, he was just awesome. I've never seen energy like that guy had, man. I mean, um, just the, yeah, just the warmth and the energy that he brought to that dining hall, man. I mean, that guy was, uh, man, that, that guy was, a an energetic and just, um, you know, lively soul, dude, and yeah, um, no, he was an icon. Every every time I think about that place, he he's right up there. In my thoughts, um, yeah. To share oh, a, a special memory I have with uh, with Hector, man. We um, I remember we casted him in a second year uh, film right. uh, titled Sanguinos. That was the film that's right, directed that's by right. yeah. yeah, directed by uh, Aiden Milroy, friend of the show. Shouts out, Aiden. Love yeah, you, yeah. Uh, and I was a producer on that project, and um, we casted uh, Hector as as the villain, and the villain was like a chef, um, and it was like a dark comedy uh, uh, slash like thriller kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And man, dude, Hector knocked it out of the park, dude. <laughs> he knocked it out of the park. Like I remember, he showed up. He was like, "Oh, I'm." Uh, he was like, "Man, I'm nervous," but dude, he like, man, when it was action time, man, that guy freaking crushed that role, dude. Um, per, great props to Aiden's casting too. Yeah. I, th- I think yeah. I don't remember <laughs> whose idea it was to cast him. I'm assuming yeah. maybe it was Aiden's. I can't remember, but. 
yeah. But anyway, rest in peace to um, Hector Lopez. We wish his family the best. Um, and if you went to the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, feel free to comment uh, a rest in peace and share. Um, feel free to share a funny story or just a good memory yeah. that you had with uh, with with our man Hector. Yeah. But all that being said, especially talking about a man who always had a smile on his face, always made other people smile, um, we were talking about comedians. That's right. And it's it's interesting because, you know, I guess you – when it comes to favorite comedians, right, I think that the thing that I've always wrestled with with comedy is that, you know, I will listen to somebody like Chappelle or I will listen to Bill Burr, whoever, you name it. And they always go like, oh, you know, this guy's a favorite comedian or, or that person's favorite comedian or that woman's favorite comedian. And <laughs> a lot of the time people mention Eddie Murphy. And it's interesting mm. because, you know, as a, as a lover of comedy, love, I love stand-up and I study stand-up and I, I like going down to the roots, you know, of, of such a, a beautiful art form that makes, there's, there's just, you know, the whole, the whole idea of it is just making people laugh. Yeah, you know? yeah. Although ultimately, although lately it's been, leaning a lot to like i don't know i guess controversy for whatever reason but you know i will go back and listen to the comedy specials or watch comedy specials from like old legends of the craft eddie murphy being one of them you know and it's interesting because i went back maybe like in 2016 2017 i went back and listened to, to eddie murphy if not before that my brother and i watched it together his delirious special um and i remember watching that and just being like oh this is kind of funny <laughs> and that was, right yeah that, that was like my that was like my my you know my interaction with it i was like oh this is kind of funny you know it's kind of not funny at all <laughs> and it's kind of very offensive you know <laughs> but it, but again you know and it's one of those things again with like um well, who is that guy let me look it up because rogan mentions a guy that gets mentioned a lot like a lot of the time um, and Joe Rogan is like in hot water because I know that he said some non plus things about Robin Williams lately. And obviously, Robin Williams, Robin Williams passed away. So I didn't quite, hear about that. He like, um, he was just saying that Robin Williams like stole people's jokes, which seemingly it was kind of like an open secret. But he, he I guess people are not, people are not happy with how he, he said it. Um, let me see. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a weird thing to say when the guy's not around to defend himself, you know? Yeah. But I don't know. At, at the same time, I could see both sides of that because at the same time, it's like, well, w you know, what are we just supposed to like not, I don't know, talk about certain things because the person's dead? You know, like there's a lot of dead people that we talk about yeah. who, um, <laughs> you know, aren't alive to defend themselves. There's a lot of people that, you know, you know what I mean? So I don't know. It, I could see both sides of that. Yeah, I, 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 I it, obviously it, it, can see how it'd be in poor taste. Like I, right, you know, especially for such a, like, a a beloved. huge public yeah. figure like Joe Rogan. You know, yeah, and and a beloved icon like Robin Williams. And it's what you know. I I watched the clip, and it's it, it was strange because I haven't seen that episode. He just kind of said it in such like. If you watch the clip of him saying that stuff about Robin, it just kind of comes off like like he just like didn't like him or something. I don't know what the really? I, I don't know what it is. It just came across as like weirdly mean, like mean spirited, even if what he was saying was actually true, which what it seems like it was actually true. Um, it's interesting though because I know that a lot of people have so much love for him. With like you know, there's an episode of Louis that Robin Williams is in, um, where like him and, and Robin Williams just like sit down and and to have like lunch. And they like reminisce about a guy that it's yeah, like an episode where like a guy passed episode. away. Everybody yeah. hated that guy. And the only people who show up are Louis and Robin Williams. <laughs> That's right. I remember that. Love that episode, man. Robin such Robin was Robin Williams oh, Robin Williams always had such like a warmth to him. But, but oh, again, sure. Robin is one of those people though that I've seen his stand up. I didn't I don't like Robin's stand up. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't seen like any stand of his stand up. I he's one of those actors that he he's like a comfort actor for me. I, yeah. I don't do you have like com I'm sure you have like comfort actors that maybe like remind you like when you see them you're like oh like not even necessarily like actors where it's like yes like this guy's the best or this you know she's the best actress ever or whatever but it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. at, just actors that like maybe bring you back to childhood or whatever like I have mm -hmm. a lot of those like Jim Carrey is one of those for me 
For sure, for sure. Or or Robin Williams is another one. Um, you know, I I could probably name off some more. Adam Sandler is definitely one for me. Just uh, funny because a lot of those are comedic actors too. But yeah, it's just yeah. like actors who I could name other ones like non comedic. I'm sure, but. But yeah, I've never seen Robin stand up, but I've heard people parody it. Like I know Nick Mullen parried my good friend Nick Mullen par- parodied it quite a bit. Mm. Um, I know Family Guy did like a yeah. cutaway about it like a long time yeah. ago. I remember, yeah, where someone would just say a word and Robin Williams would be like, "Ooh, uh, miss, uh, my missile hits your politics," you know, like <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> you know? yeah. And that his stand up was like that. His stand up was just like this like quick fire thing. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, like with Eddie Murphy, it's like you'll watch this hour long stand up special and then you'll have like a chuckle like every like 15 minutes. And we're like, well, that's clever. Right. And then and then it was just like just you watching something. Right. And the guy that I was wanted to talk about with Rogan is Sam Kennison. Like Rogan always Rogan always mentions Sam Kennison. Sam Kennison was one of these guys that he was like was very irreverent and he was just like shouting. It's always shouting. So he's shouting his punchlines and just like being getting on stage and just like screaming his long sound. Oh, well, that's another know. one of those. Well, that's where Joe Rogan got it from, I guess. No, it is, yeah. And that's another one of those where it's like I don't enjoy that guy's comedy at all. And not yeah. none of not not a single thing I've ever seen from Kennison I've laughed at. And obviously with Rogan, I've only laughed at his comedy like <laughs> maybe twice in yeah. my life, you know. Oh yeah, um, yeah. So it's fascinating, man. Just like, you know, it's, it's fascinating because obviously most people watch Lady Snowblood and there's something that always intrigues me about the things that inspire other people, other creatives who I look up to, you know. Um, and with stand-up comedy, it's just funny. I think it, maybe it's just because of how comedy ages and, and delivery and tone and how, you know, different generations kind of have a different taste for these things. Yeah. But with stand-up comedy i've seen it just be like the most just like um strong example of that of of going back to looking at something that somebody else is like this is incredible and i love it and inspired me and me being like oh if they say it's incredible and i like their stuff you know if Chappelle says that murphy's great and like i like Chappelle, let me go back and look at murphy's stuff and then i go back and i go like oh this sucks ass (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) this sucks and i think it's i think it's because everybody can remember like you know you can always remember laughing at something and i think that's what it is for those comedian guys like they remember the people who inspired them to becoming comedians you know because at that point in time 70s or 80s that was like the greatest shit ever but like now it just sucks ass, you know, and it's funny because at some point, you know, maybe, you know, for a different generation, it'll be like, oh, listen, listen to this, you know, bit from Shane Gillis. And they'll, uh, you know, they'll be just like, you know, just waiting for the <laughs> laugh. You remember how you much you laughed. Right. And they're just like, oh, this kind of sucks ass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like most stand stand up comedy is like the way you described it, where like every 15 minutes is just kind of like a chuckle. Like, oh, that's clever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that was something. Huh? Yeah. That like when something. we were talking about this before we started recording, it's like it kind of is an exercise in disappointment in a way where it's like I feel like most comedians that you I put on, I'm just kind of like, yeah, it's fine, I guess. But then there's like. There's a select few like Louis C.K. obviously is a is the goat like yeah. any stand up clip from that guy is is going to make me laugh my my ass off. Yeah. That guy is so funny, so brilliant. Like he finds a way to just take like really like weirdly specific things yeah. that you thought no yeah. one else noticed. Yeah. Or that like he he finds ways to unlock like memories or like something that you're like, you know what? That is so fucking true. And then and then also make it like so funny and irreverent at the same time. That was his gift. But that is his gift, brother. Yeah. (laughs) Right, right, right. Yeah. (laughs) He died in a horrible masturbation accident, though, dude. (laughs) (laughs) No, but uh he like I think the best example of that is um he has a bit where he talks about <laughs> um where he talks about like how lame it is to go to gift shops, you know, and and already I'm like that's so hilarious cuz that's like I hate that, dude. Like mm-hmm. I as I've gotten older, I guess, like certain, you know, like I like antique stores and stuff, but yeah, like weird just 
tacky gift shops. I hate walking through those. I hate like I hate that stuff. Like when you're on vacation, and like he was talking about how like you know you walk into like one of those little shops. And you open the door and it's like, ding-a-ling-a-ling-a-ling-a-ling. And I was like, that's so true. You know, and then he ta- starts talking about how there's someone there who like, you know, owns the shop. And, and then he, yep. and then he said, they always, do. They always own the shop. And then he said, and I quote, really this, so this is what you did? This shop, this is what you did instead of kill yourself? And like, <laughs> <laughs> so he, like, he takes something that's really relatable, just like, and, and really specific, like that bell ringing when you walk in. Cause then you're like, then you can't unhear it. You're like, oh my God, that is so true. Every time you walk into one of those shops, it's always like, lee, 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 lee. Mm-hmm. you know, and then he, and then he says something really like, you know, off, like, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know, inappropriate for lack of a better word. But yeah. yeah, so like Louis is a genius. Um, I think George Carlin is like that too. George Carlin, yeah. I think, is really fucking funny. He's he's great. Carlin Carlin is interesting with me for me because I I feel like Carlin is more clever than funny. Honestly, yeah. Like I, that's you know again like with the stuff of his that I've seen, I'm always just like, oh, that's clever. Oh, that's clever. You know, but he always keeps me entertained. Yeah. But with Carlin, again, it's one of those things where I, I don't really laugh all that often. Really? You know, Interesting. like I, I really hold like, I really hold guys like Louis in terms of like comedy prowesses in hard regard because of that. Cause it's like both being able to make an interesting observation and making me laugh, you know, where it's like a lot of guys these days, the people holding high regard, like Rock, like Chris Rock, to me, is such like a whatever comedian. Like, yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Chris Rock, I think you and I saw that special of his together, like the newest one, and I don't think either of us laughed. No, <laughs> I think maybe we chuckled maybe once or twice. Right, it was terrible. That that special was terrible. Yeah. Oh, like the yeah, one with the I remember Smith that. Slap stuff, like terrible. Didn't we? Oh yeah, didn't we like do like a double feature? It was like that, and then Louis' latest yeah, special think, at the time. I think we watched Louis. Yeah. yeah, which Louis is also not that good. The latest one's not that good. No, that one. That one was kind of disappointing. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, Bill Burr? What do you think about Bill Burr's stand up? I feel like he's funnier on his podcast. Like he makes me mm-hmm. laugh with his podcast, but I feel like. Uh, again like i feel like his stand-up it's like it's good it's clever but i don't i don't know i feel like burr i feel like burr like i feel like he plateaued yeah honestly i feel like he like plateaued like i remember i remember i saw his uh, his stand-up there's so there's one of those things black and white that's like the best one like his black and white one i let me let me try to see if i can find it uh Oh, I know which one you're talking about. The one where he's like doing like a half smile. I can't remember. I can picture it though, and it's black and white on the front. I'm sorry you feel that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the name of it. That's That's his best special, bar none. His best special. Yeah. That's a twenty. That's a 2014 special. You know, and that's the special where he. I feel like he like peaked because he like just took stand up comedy. I feel like not only did he in that special embody it himself, like what his style was. But I feel like he also elevated it, you know, where how he played with with the microphone, like, you know, with distance and with the voices. There's there, He does this whole bit about, I think I like about like, ah, I don't remember. I don't remember exactly what it is, but he has he does this whole bit like about like Hitler or something and like sending like missiles to like um, to like vacation you know those vacation like touring like boats ships cruise things? You know ships a cruise ship <laughs> yeah and like about him like just like destroying cruise ships you know and and he like pokes the mic and he makes his voices like it's so that special is so animated and to me that's like the quintessential like this is the quintessential builder like special yeah. um and he i feel like since then like everything he's made since then paper tiger like everything he's made since then has been like a lesser version. Yeah, you know, I remember of, pa- Paper Tiger. A lot of the same jokes. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bilber, yeah, he's good with like, he's good with like, um, like capturing like vocal tonality and like with other people, like other people talking. Like there, there was this one moment that I always thought was so funny on his podcast where he yeah. was recording in a hotel and he was talking about how the walls were thin. <laughs> he was describing like, he was like imitating how you could like what it sounded like to just hear other people in the hotel. And he yeah. was like, yeah, I could just thought like I'll be fucking sitting here. And then I just hear like, 
and then you hear like the guy you know and i just the way he was doing it was like so fucking funny where you could like relate to that you know sitting in a hotel room or in any room and just hearing voices through the wall and like you can't hear what they're saying but like you could just hear like the and like i don't know it's just like the way he i can't replicate it you know it's like because the way comedy is like such a specific thing where there is all of that those ingredients like timing yeah. tonality like you know I, I i'm not even really i don't know much about like the art like the specific art of stand-up or whatever mm-hmm. but yeah i i like also i think comedy i like i feel like comedy is more than stand-up too um because there's like a lot of really cool like stand-up adjacent type stuff like for yeah. instance, you have like podcasting now, which is uh, you know, albeit it's a it's very oversaturated, but there's a lot of great comedic content from podcast um, comedians um, on podcasts, and then you have things like like Jim Florentine has like prank call tapes, you know, yeah, um, yeah. and then Bill Maher has like a you know a talk show right where that's also political. It's like a political talk show, but you know, he gets Bill Maher, he gets some zingers in there. I wouldn't, I don't think like, I've never really watched like his full stand up, but I do watch his show once in a while. Did and I, like, Bill Maher says some funny shit. So sometimes stand up isn't always the best. Um, no. Stand up's not always the best no. medium to actually make you laugh. Like, no, not no, always. Because stand up jokes are very, very specific. Like, sometimes people yeah. do bits on podcasts, or Bill Maher yeah. will say things on his show, or things will be, you know, interactions will happen on prank call tapes from Jim Florentine or whatever it might be that you can't really replicate in stand up, you know? Right. So no, it's, exactly, it's tricky. Exactly. No, I feel like stand up's like hard weird. mode almost. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right about that. It is hard mode. Because one thing is listening to the Sea Town Boys and listening to Nick Mullen and Stavros and all those guys making each other laugh and laughing alongside with them. Right. And another thing is being like, well, now Stavros, do it on your own, on a stage, in front of everybody. Exactly. <laughs> make me laugh. Exactly. Yeah, no. I mean, dude, if someone it said, if someone challenged you and said, like, Edward, I'll give you, you know, a thousand dollars to either, you know, create like a really funny fucking prank call or do a solid 10 minutes of stand up like me yeah. i'd pick the prank call that'd be way For easier sure. to do a prank. For you sure. know what i mean yeah because you can just improvise that right and and yeah. you can depend on the other person's reaction on the other end of the line like you know yeah and yeah. like you said i mean the the um the come town boys you you, you always self-censor <laughs> i don't think the sea town boys. <laughs> that makes it sound like it could be something even worse um but uh <laughs> but like the like um that show like ni- i feel like ni- you know probably a good 75% of their bits maybe more wouldn't even work in a stand up format no no so i feel like stand up is kind of hard mode for comedy in a way but it's a great art form that i think is more than just stand up like stand up is is the foundation and but Especially now in like the digital age, there's so many other things that you can do. Stand up, with I feel like stand up, stand up is like like you said like like the foundation. Like it's like stand up is like peak. Yeah, it's like it's like it, the truest form right. of the art form, which I, I find fascinating. It's like, um, yeah, but it's it's interesting to me because I feel like other mediums are not like that. You know, like if I were if I were to name, if I were to title the past like you know, 10 minutes of this conversation, I would, I would just basically title it like stand up comedy ages like milk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. We're just, we're just ages hor- horrendously, but I feel like other things are not like that, you know, cause again, um, some of our favorite filmmakers, Paul Thomas Anderson, Spike Jones, you know, um, Alfonso Cuaron, like any of these guys, right. Um, I've, I've gone back, to watch the movies that inspired their movies. You know, with Paul Thomas Anderson, I took a whole class and, and watched Robert Altman films. And also you and I watched a movie, you and I watched Putney Swo, which was by Robert Downey Sr. Yeah. Um, which was a huge inspiration, not only on, on PTA, but also on, on Louis C.K. Like both of them talk about Putney Swo, it was like a huge inspiration. Um, so I've gone back, you know, and like watched a lot of the movies that inspired the people that inspired me. And I love those movies. I loved Putney Swope, you know, 
I loved um, Lady of Snowblood last week that inspired Tarantino. Um, and then with music, it's the same. Like with music and other things that inspire these people that we listen to today are just like outright incredible, like classics, you know, like um, whether it's like Nina Simone or whatever, you know, or the 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 music that, you know, like the Eiley brothers, it's like stuff that Kanye or whoever takes like samples from, you know, like the sample in um, Devil in a New Dress, you mm, know, I was yeah. like, what is this from? And then I went back and listened to the Eiley brothers and I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> like this in and of itself, you know, is like incredible. And then a Devil, Devil in a New Dress is also incredible. Yeah. Um. So it's fascinating how these things are different, you know, depending on like what medium we're talking about, you know, how how these things are just like, Either you enrich yourself or you make yourself poorer <laughs> by listening to Eddie Murphy's, you know, <laughs> delirious. <laughs> no hate to Eddie Murphy. I love Eddie Murphy. I actually, um, we watched Shrek um, two days ago and I loved it. Dude, Shrek's so good. Oh, dude, Shrek um, is so fucking funny. Well, here's Shrek again making an appearance on the podcast. Yeah, but, but it's one of those, it was one of those things though where it's like, it's like you said, it's like with Eddie Murphy, it's like his stand-up comedy might have aged horrendously, but his acting's great. Right, know? right. And it's really funny as Dunky in Shrek. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, an interesting point about comedy too, like not only is comedy, you know, there you could argue that it ages poorly, but also... It's I think I heard I heard this somewhere. I don't know if this is like completely true or partially true or what, but I think I believe like horror is one of the most marketable Mm -hmm. genre movie genres and comedy is like one of the least in terms of like overseas. 100 percent. Yeah, because it doesn't translate. Right. Because and and what's interesting is I watched a video um, at some point recently where a guy, some European from some European country um, who reacted to the come town clip of liberal Elmo, that bit Uh and (laughs) hilarious bit, but like the guy doesn't laugh at all. And he was like, Oh, there's like one good joke in it. Gut busting. Yeah. Oh, I was too, dude. But the thing is, it's like, well, of course he didn't like, you know, he's from Europe. Like he doesn't know, of course, you know, who, you know, he probably is not that familiar with Elmo. Right. Right. He's probably, you know, he doesn't know like the whole, I mean, Nick was painting Elmo as like a New York liberal who works like for vice or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, you're not going to get that if you're from a, right. There's so many, there's so many nuances to that, to that whole interpretation. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you think you could think about so many um, comedic bits that like wouldn't translate in another culture because so much of comedy is cultural like so right. much mu- i mean that's all observational comedy is it's like you're mm-hmm. observing what's in our culture and you're talking mm-hmm. about it so dude and I, I can tell you firsthand my experience oh yeah because you're experience. you're uh, dual Ex- citizenship well that, that's the thing man because i grew up in the dominican republic where you know humor there is different from humor here obviously you know and I remember that when I first came to this country and I, you know, was learning English, you know, learning, you know, customs and cultural differences and, yeah. and how to how to interact with people in this American Western way. Um, I found myself at like the, you know, all my life up until the age of, you know, 11, when I was a preteen, all my life I was like, I'm funny. You know, <laughs> that's, what, that, that's what I had as a kid. I was like, I'm a funny kid. You know, I, was, I remember thinking that, like, I can make people laugh. I, you know, as a kid, I was had pride in being able to, like, make like my grandparents laugh and stuff like that. And then I come to this country and then, like, you know, six, seven months in, I learn how to speak English. You know, I'm still getting used to certain things. But I remember, I remember saying to us, talking to my brother and, and saying to him, like, I don't think I'm funny anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I legitimately said that to my brother because I was like, I don't know how to communicate with people. <laughs> yeah. you know? Like, I don't know what's funny to these people. I don't know what's going on. And that, you know, that was my experience. And I feel like that speaks like volumes to what you're talking about, like the cultural differences of humor, you know, and how you can just feel like such an outsider. Yeah. You know, because it's just like, you know, what people are saying doesn't make me laugh and what I'm saying doesn't make them laugh. You know, right, it's right. weird. <laughs> well, obviously a lot of it rubbed off on you because you and I have yeah. shared many a laugh. Um yeah. I mean la- dude, fucking busted my gut last week, dude, talking about the Brock oh, Lesnar yeah. thing. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Yeah. But yeah, dude, you know, I think then like a year after 
not even a year, like a few months after me uttering that sentence, my brother was like, ah, I feel like I get it now. <laughs> you, stopped bom- yeah. you stopped bombing at open mics. Yeah, I stopped bombing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you ever do stand up, dude? If, if you, like, do you think you would ever do it? At, at, like, yeah. Just for yeah. the experience? Yeah, for 100%. Like, I feel like if I was in the right situation, yeah, right mood, right scenario, you know, let's say you and I are like at a bar or something and there's like an open mic and you're like, you know, I dare you to do it. I'll be like, fuck, okay. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would do it. Yeah. You know? What's Even the deal? Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's the something... deal with? Because <laughs> I feel like I could also maybe, maybe just like in a weird, like, um, in a weird like way, I feel like maybe I could succeed by just doing a funny voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, milk tastes yeah. weird. <laughs> What's the deal with sex? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, could, I feel I like, dude, I, I could probably crush like ironically if I had like, exactly. you know, six drinks in me, six plus, yeah. you know, like I could yeah. I could probably crush in an ironic way where like this guy's just like, an idiot. You exactly. Because I feel like part of it too you know if you're like exercising something like that it's like you know i feel like when you're doing something like that self-awareness is your worst enemy. yeah for sure <laughs> oh yeah 100 percent. being able like being in your head and listening to yourself breathing you're like oh god I'm, I'm actually doing this yeah yeah i i truly believe to this day because i mean you and i like we we knew uh I don't, I don't know if we talked about this on the pod but we obviously knew someone in in college who like tried to make people laugh just like oh yeah all day every all day every, every class day. every minute of every second every of public every interaction class. was just oh, a stage my. for this for this person yeah, yeah never made anyone laugh made me laugh once throughout the yeah. course of an entire year of having every class with this person dude yeah. um and i truly believe like to be just like a funny person or to make people laugh you just got to make yourself laugh you just got to say shit yeah. that you think is that funny you, yeah, you think it's funny 100 percent. because dude like sometimes i'll say shit like i i was you know i remember like um uh me jack and and jack's girlfriend were like um it was like after it was a saint patty's day or like the saturday Mm. before or whatever a few months ago otherwise known as edward's birthday exactly (laughs) dude uh the more important holiday but we were um i mean i was like hammered jack was like probably pretty drunk and then his girlfriend was like not she was dd and she was driving us. She drove us to McDonald's because we had the munchies, dude. <laughs> and we were, dude, we're sitting in the uh, drive thru. And then they told, they did the whole thing where it's like, mm, pull up, we'll be, we'll be out in yeah, we'll be out 15 in minutes. minutes. Um, and so we were sitting there and, like, dude, I just, I had them in stitches, dude. But, like, yeah. there's other times, dude, that I'll say something that, again, I think is really. F- you know, like when I had them in stitches though in the car, like I was just saying shit that I thought was funny. I was making myself laugh. But yeah. then there's other times, dude, where I'll say shit that again I think is hilarious and, and right. nobody laughs. But it's like it yeah. doesn't feel like I'm bombing or embarrassing myself because it's like I'm laughing. You know, You're I'm laughing. having a good yeah. time. You know, you know, you know what? The, you know what? The positive thing has been for me in my life that seemingly, and I only say this because of experience and what I've been told, I have a contagious laugh. Yeah, yeah, yo, dude, <laughs> so because- for sure. For so because sure. of that, I've gotten away with with actually being not <laughs> funny at all. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that's not true, dude. No, you do have a contagious laugh. Holy shit, man! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> dude, who are I guess to kind of close out this thread, dude? Like, dude, hit me with your top your top three comedians, dude. Top three comedians. Oof, this is rough for me because I don't, I don't. I don't, I don't have, ah, fuck. Like, I have my own personal list that I, like, document the things that I watch a lot of the time. Like, anytime yeah. that I watch, like, anything that's not a movie, I put it, like, on my own list that I have on my computer. Um, so my letterbox is, like, doesn't have any stand-up comedy that I've seen. It just has movies and documentaries. Yeah. Um, but off the top of my head, just remembering the people that I've loved that have made me laugh. Um Louis C.K., you know. Yeah. Um, obviously, like I said when I did the Kanye retrospective, you know, Louis not the greatest person in the world, and I don't endorse the things that that guy has done or said, but he's made me laugh, you know, and he's he's consistently been the human being that has made me laugh 
you know, outside of my friends and family the most. Yeah. So he is, you, and you know this, like he's my favorite comedian. He's been my favorite comedian forever. Yeah. Um, you remember how excited I was whenever a new stand-up would come out and I would just go ahead and watch it on my computer. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so if we're talking about, I'm going to leave it at stand-ups and not like a comedian in general. So for stand-ups, like Louis C.K. is number one. Um, number two, I would say um, Dave Chappelle. You know, at this exact same moment, that's the only person that I can come up with in terms of like me, like really loving what their stand-up is. So Dave Chappelle is number two. Um, and then number three, if Bill, if, if um, Hannibal Burris was more consistent, I would say him, but he has not put out a, put out a stand-up special since like 2016. Yeah. Um, so because there's just people that I love that just don't put stuff out like with enough consistency as stand-ups. Um, and Hannibal Burris is one of them. So I'm going to say Louis, I'm going to say Dave, and then I'm going to say fuck it bill burr <laughs> yeah 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 okay yeah. what uh, about you that's that's like the most generic fucking list i could have said <laughs> but yeah in terms of like okay so two categories first category is stand-up only in terms of just pure yeah. stand-up yeah. Lu- louis ck top 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 mm-hmm. by a by a large margin too yeah same for me um and then i would say george carlin and then probably mm-hmm. Probably Tom Segura. That guy has had me in stitches. I love Tom. Yeah. Oh, I love Tom. Oh, I love Tom Segura. And there's people that I have. There's people that I don't have enough experience with, like Richard Pryor. You know, I. You know, for my own shame, I've not. I don't have a lot of experience with Richard Pryor. I want to listen to his stuff. He's one of those old guys that I. I have such low expectations. Yeah. But yeah, dude, Tom Segura is great. Tom Segura is like one of the the, the newer like like really great comedians for sure. Yeah, I mean Ball Hog, that special dude, that that mm-hmm. that shit, that shit has me in tears, dude. It's still, I've watched that like multiple times, and that that special has me in tears. So st- yeah. stand up. <laughs> Louis C.K., George Carlin, and probably Tom Segura. Yeah, and then, there's, some, there's there's other guys though that I like really love. Um, there's a guy named Cheng Wang. Um, oh yeah, what's his special name? Sweet and Juicy. Love Cheng Wang. That guy's great. I still like, gotta watch that special. special. You recommended that well, to only, me. Yeah, dude, Cheng Wang is fantastic. Like I watched that and I was dying, but he only has one special, so I can't really recommend them too much. Right, right. Um, Stavros is good, you know. Shane Gillis is good. Nick Mullins great, underrated. There's like a lot of guys here and there. Yeah, but they have to prove themselves a little bit more, honestly. Like there's not enough to go around between those guys. Yeah, for sure. And then second category for me would be just stand up plus other, other adjacent. So we're yeah. talking like podcasts, prank call tapes, you know, um, just all that, all that. Um, you know anything extra shit. anything comedy related outside of anything outside com- of just stand up yeah, yeah anything comedy rela- yeah comedy cuz it's an art form that encompasses yeah. more than just stand up like we said in my opinion at least what's your top 3 when we take everything into account again louis ck is still at the top because yeah. you know you got stand up's just that good and then also you've got his like you know his show just his podcast appearances where he's hilarious um and again had me in tears uh, so again, Louis C.K. still takes the crown for me, dude. Um, Nick Mullen is a close second. Um, mm-hmm. Like on Come Down, just just has me in stitches. Has said some of the most the funniest shit. He really pushes the envelope, and he said some very offensive shit that I mm-hmm. don't know how has how it hasn't come back to bite him. <laughs> honestly, at this yeah. point, but he he <laughs> has said some of the funniest shit that I've ever heard in my life, and then. Three Jim Florentine, dude, for his um, prank call tapes. Those things, terrorizing telemarketers, his yeah. prank call series. Those have me in stitches, dude. Those are so funny. Um, now, so yeah. to ask you this, to uh, like, to, I guess to add something on top of this, um, yeah. is it like with this with this specific ruling, like, is somebody like, like? Um, is is uh fuck what's his name? I'm forgetting. Is Larry David included in this? Yeah, yeah. Because I guess yeah, if you're doing like stand up plus, yeah. yeah, I I think we could count TV shows and movies, especially because he's a writer. You know, he's he's yeah. a writer on those shows. Um, you know, I think like yeah, definitely. 
Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. It's hard that, to leave Larry change, David out of there. That's change your answer like, if, we, if we bring that in. Yeah, dude. I didn't even think of Larry, man. Yeah, dude. Larry from Curve, man. Yeah, maybe he might replace Jim Florentine in that case because he's a freaking comedic genius. Yeah. yeah, so maybe it'd be – Jim Florentine's an honorable mention for his – his podcast is actually really freaking funny too, um, Jim Florentine's, um, but his prank call tapes are hilarious. So yeah. I'll put Jim Florentine as an honorable mention. Uh, okay. Yeah. His, I feel like under those – Yeah, go okay. ahead. I, I was finished, so, yeah. Because uh, I feel like if, if those are the – you know, if we, if we set those as like parameters – you know, then for me, it has to be like Louis and then Larry, <laughs> yeah, like or yeah. Larry and then Louis. They get interchangeable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then three in this scenario, like everything, you know, podcasting and everything included. Um, uh, mm, I don't, I don't have like that. I don't. I love Nick Mullen, but I don't. I don't think I have the same level of appreciation that you have for him. Yeah. Um. Nor for Florentine. Like, I love both those guys. I think they're hilarious. Um, but I think you have a closer, like, appreciation for them that I do. Yeah. Um, honestly, Conan O'Brien. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. That's a surprise. For what? I love, I've always loved Conan. My whole life I've loved Conan. He, you know um, what? He is pretty fucking funny, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. He, like, are well, you talking about, like, his late night show? What what work are you referring to? His late night show? Exactly. Like, he wrote on The show, Simpsons, he, too. You can't forget also, that. He also has a podcast. He has a podcast um, called, like, Conan Needs Friends, I believe is the name of the podcast. Um, which every time I see clips from it is great. I loved his appearance on Hot Ones recently. Like, I just love him as, like, a comedic personality. And what yeah. he's, like, contributed, you know, and I love seeing him. Yeah. Um, so because of that, Conan. He, he Conan, was great Conan on Conan Curb, movie. too. Did you see that episode with him? On- no, I haven't seen it. Dude, I haven't finished Curb. Oh, you got to finish it, it, man. I can't believe you haven't finished Curb, man. I know. Man. I know. <laughs> I, you've been busy, though. I mean, shit. It's I'll get to no it. No small it'll task. Be like my, it'll be my reward. It'll be like um. I'll be like when it's like when Thanos snaps and then he just goes to be a farmer. That'll be my reward for my <laughs> all my labor. Yeah. <laughs> I'll watch. I'll watch. I'll watch the last season. Dude, the way your voice just like strayed with my labor. <laughs> 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 you like you sounded like you were already tired, like from all your work. You just like I am already oh, tired. For my reward for my labor. <laughs> I'm already tired. <laughs> it was like a little Wayne voice effect. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, I got to put Bill Burr too as an honorable mention in that second category. Yeah, because his podcast yeah, is his so podcast. funny. I mean, yeah, yeah like I, I gave that example, and just when he's like reading email newsletters too, that's my favorite part when he's reading. Um. Um people emailing in that mm-hmm. that kills me dude he 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 gets in some great zingers he's just like a funny person yeah. um and that's the thing with stand-up man you could be funny as shit but your stand-up could not be all that um which i'm not saying bill burrs isn't all that but i'm just saying like again i i've beat that horse to death but it is a tough art form he's been, for he's sure to go for a reason. i respect those guys yeah i can see why they call us civilians dude <laughs> no, no, fuck that. <laughs> all those guys that started that, Rogan and, and what's his face, Bert and all those guys, those guys screw all those guys. Bert Cr- Bert Kreisner is not that funny, man. His No, Bert's not funny. No. His Bert, dude, I, Bert I, I saw like actually him not funny. Yeah. I saw him live, man. I uh, he was like the headliner and he was like the least funny one there. The least funny guy. <laughs> yeah. Like he Did Hinchcliffe open for him? Uh no. It was like the people, it was like he was the headliner, and the people who opened for him were. It was like I don't remember what the order was, but it was Shane Gillis, Joey Diaz, oof, oof. um, Nikki Glazer, and mm. one other guy who's I can't remember his name, but he, I don't think he's that he was famous. Was the headliner and Burt Kreischer was the headliner. With Gillis and Joey Diaz opening for him. Ooh, yeah, dude, that yeah. I mean, he's going behind a lot of hit, like big hitters for a guy that wasn't even a stand up. Like he he became a stand up because like Rogan and his friends were like pushing him, but he was just like a like a funny dude that that would host TV shows. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He hosted something on the Travel Channel. Yeah, and and then he became a stand-up, you know. And then he was 
Yeah, then I guess, I mean, his, the machine thing was so huge that it just carried him. <laughs> I remember sitting there in, in the stadium when he, and he started telling that machine story and, and I was, all, yeah. And I was already like, you know, and that was like, you could tell it was going to be the last, like the big hurrah. And I was mm-hmm. already kind of underwhelmed from his stand up. And then he started mm-hmm. telling that story and I was like, okay, it's building, it's building. And then, like, when he gets to the whatever punchline where it's just some Russian guy being like, eat the machine. The machine. Yeah. I was like, that's not fucking funny, dude. That's not that funny at all. Boo. <laughs> <That's> funny. <laughs> That'd be so funny. This is the one guy. Boo. Oh, dude, shout, I'll, I'll, I'll mention, too, to um, uh, uh, new in town, John Mulaney. <laughs> John Mulaney's incredible. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's good. John Mulaney's good. He is pretty funny, yeah, I gotta say. Funny. I don't know, though, if John Mulaney, I don't really like walk around and think. Uh, no, there's I okay. His bits all the time. Yeah, there's dude, a couple dude, bits. Me, not, they're me they're surfacing. Boo, me saying boo not funny is I stole that from John Mulaney because it's in one of his specials. Oh, that's right. Yeah. It's yeah, like I remember you he... saying that all the time when we talk about like Ooh, something. Not funny. Yeah, yeah dude. Because he took that from he has a bit in one of his specials where he says that he was like he talks about when he was working on SNL. Yeah. And that he was like trying to write jokes for Mick Jagger. And that he like writes a joke yeah. for Mick Jagger. And Mick Jagger was like, boo, not funny. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. That's where he took that from, dude. Yeah. No, no, dude, my sister says that all the time. She yeah. like she'll just be like, not funny. Not funny. Yeah, because yeah, she that's where I stole that from. I would say John Mulaney's probably my sister's favorite comedian for sure. Oh, he's great. I love Mulaney. He's yeah. great. I saw him live. He's great. In Charlotte. Oh, that's dope, dude. That's dope. I've had a long relationship with Mulaney because I I I discovered Mulaney as a comedian exactly when he came out. Really? Like exactly when he came out, like back in like 2013, 2014, like when he came out as a comedian, my brother and I watched him, you know, and that uh, that's how long I've been like on that, on it with that guy. You know, I used to, we used to just sing his little opening, like John Mulaney. You know? <laughs> that's I've, awesome. I've, I've been on the Mulaney train for a while. So I love Mulaney. Obviously he wouldn't make like my top three, but you know, I, I love the guy. Anyway. Yeah, he's like an uh, he's like a Jerry Seinfeld upgrade. I feel like. Yeah, for he's, sure. He's like a Jerry Seinfeld upgrade with a dash of Louis C.K. You know, just yeah. just like a pinch. And then, then there's guys that I love, just outside completely of stand up, like Ricky Gervais. Like I love Ricky Gervais completely outside of his stand up. Oh yeah, because his stand up's not that good. No, his stand up sucks. It's man. just him making fun of religion. That's yeah. all it is. But whenever he hosts the Golden Globes, you read the Bible. (laughs) Oh, you believe in a man in the sky? Yeah, but other (laughs) than that, like his personality is funny. When he hosts, he's funny. Like whenever he he does the Golden Globes, he's hilarious. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh, and Louis C.K. He's the best character. He's like the funniest character on that show. He's like the funniest side character. He's like, well, Louis, I have some bad news. He's like, your heart has shat itself because <laughs> you have a condition called fat loser gingeritis. <laughs> That's a good your face. Dude, he's, <laughs> him on that show, every time he like tells Louis, he tricks Louis that he's like going to die because he's, he's Louis' like doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's like but, one episode that ends with him like calling Louis and being like, "Oh, Louis, I found something," you know, and like Louis still <laughs> falls for it. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, and then I mean Jerry, I love Jerry too. Like I gotta love Jerry. Like not only Seinfeld, but comedians in cars getting coffee. Like yeah, I love Jerry. Yeah, and Seinfeld Jerry. as a show is like comedic genius. Again, I mean, yeah. I've been watching a good bit of Seinfeld lately. Just, it's a good show to just put on him and, him and Larry. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. But you had a, a film topic for us. Yeah. I had a film topics, a film topic 15 minutes ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Let me see. This is what I wanted to talk about. So this is, this is like film. This is like film, film. This is like film nerd stuff. Um, Criterion shit. This is under R slash Ari Aster, <laughs> or as we like to call him, as I like to call him, Ari Ass Hat. Yeah, um, I'm not on the under, Ass Hat train. No, if 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 ever we are to meet Ari Aster, or if ever Ari Aster is responsible for like green lighting a project of us, 
obviously he's going to greenlight your project. And obviously he's going to be very spiteful about me calling him Harry ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, That's why I'm being smart, dude. I'm just hanging back, letting you talk all the shit about him. So somebody <laughs> under the subreddit, somebody said, anyone, anyone see, come and see with a foreword from Ari, from Ari today at Paris Theater. Some guy blurted out a question to Ari and got booed, and then the same guy got into a fist fight outside of the theater after the movie. Holy shit! <laughs> so, and then somebody basically wrote a whole thing. This is from um, Mick Mathis, like M I C M A T H I S. This is the top comment with the most like upvotes um, on this. And this has been news on like on film, the film thing, the film scene. And the person said, all right, I'll bite. I went to the screening. Here's what happened. <laughs> I walked into the theater around 15 minutes closer to showtime. And there was a tall, lanky man wearing a Malcolm X t-shirt and holding a camera talking to Ari Aster in the, in the lobby. He was, very, he was very all smiles and chatty, but it seemed like he kind of cornered Ari. This happens a lot, you know, on film screenings, blah, blah, blah. So then Ari does the intro. Um, pretty brief intro off the cuff, but he was about to wrap it up. And as he's about to wrap it up, the guy screamed, I have a question that only the legendary Ari Aster could answer. <laughs> and then the person says, I want to stress this was not advertised as a Q&A. This was Ari given an intro. That's it. And uh-huh. not to answer my own thing, but if you're going to do these things, blah, blah, blah. so Ari starts stammering a little. But the man proceeds, by the way, camera pointed at Ari <laughs> as Ari's on stage. <laughs> he continues, I am an inspiring filmmaker about 30 years old. You yourself are about 37 years young. <sighs> is that correct? <laughs> I don't know. Even if your age is public knowledge, <laughs> doing, doing this in a forced Q&A is an uncomfortable move. Oh, for That's sure. when Ari asked, are we really doing this? <laughs> the man then starts doing <laughs> The what advice would you have for an aspiring filmmaker spiel? Uh, and immediately gets shut down and booed by the audience. <laughs> Hell yeah. The two organizers from this from the American Cinematheque, who were using the Paris Theater to exhibit the film, sprung up and go, Hey, Eric Astor, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to shut it down. The three of them ushered off and the movie started. Um I want to stress this also for those of you who don't know, come and see. It's like one of the most devastating films ever made. Yeah. Same levels of war, violence, Nazi torturing civilians, burning people alive, etc. So the film wraps, and as we're walking out, I see the guy, and he's talking out loud to what seems like no one. <laughs> but again, camera out, filming people. I'm not kidding. Some lines I heard from him. How did he? That was a quite. That was quite a movie. <laughs> Hello, movie neighbor. Was wondering what you thought of the movie we just watched. Oh, God. What about you, old man? You look as old as a cookie. (laughs) (laughs) So it goes on. (laughs) So it goes on. And so then he goes, stressing, blah, 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 big mistake. So it says, a bald man in front of him turns around and goes, dude, will you just shut the F up? (laughs) Big mistake. The tall man fixates completely on him. I could only get bits of conversation there, but he seemed to be accusing this guy of trying to silence a black man. After watching a movie about prejudice against minorities and kept parroting lines about how all his followers were going to know he was a racist and his life was going to be ruined. One of my favorite lines I overheard the other guy say back was, say back was, dude, you didn't even know the director of the movie. You said Ari Aster directed it. Holy shit. So he's following him around and until a few of us, including myself, tried to calm the strange man down. A guy told him that he was doing what he was doing was uncalled for and respond and he responded, You wouldn't know you're white. <laughs> when oh, when the man was clearly not and told him as such, he got very offended. Offended and blah blah blah. It was like a QA, blah blah blah. And then he said, Then another man in glasses came up to him and said, Hey, come on, man, you look like you need a hug. The strange man accepted it, but then they went into fisticuffs. Oh. <laughs> and the strange man accused the man in glasses of slapping him and saying things like, you betrayed my trust. And then he said, blah, blah, blah. There were a couple more lines from strange man about how he was also going to, to be ruined, how he, was, you know, he was doing what Malcolm X taught him. 
A few, a, blah, blah, blah. Oh, a few starts and steps later, it was a full-on brawl. <laughs> Strange man tore glasses man's shirt completely off, and the cops got involved. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, the theater employee came out and said, all right, folks, we got another movie to prep, so please get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> and the crowd dispersed. Um, let me see. All to say would be the craziest thing to ever happen outside of a movie theater. Um, and then somebody else kind of filled in a little bit more information. And they said, strange man, sucker punched glasses man. This, the person filling in for this was a person called throwaway129802. They said, I would like to, to add, strange man said, we're messing with a black man wearing a Malcolm X t-shirt multiple times. In that you're calling out the only black man who came to this screening, which he was not. Strange man sucker punched glasses man. And it became a fist fight. <laughs> Strange man's <laughs> nose might have been broken. Lots of blood. Strange man was also yelling, oh, where are the cops when you need them? And then 20 seconds later, the cops showed up. Um, but yeah, apparently Holy that was like shit. A, that's been like a big like news and film <laughs> film scene. Wow. Um, because it, it was like, a, apparently it was just like a very strange happening. This guy just showed up, tried to harass Ari Aster, who was just like a guest, like, speaker introducing the movie and then they get into a fight with people outside and apparently the guy in glasses just kind of like patted his 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 face like that and he got angry and then it just became a, a whole a whole fist fight wow that's wild i did, so much, I did digging on this because then i actually found like footage and video of this which is hilarious really oh shit yeah. dude i gotta watch that I, i'm gonna send it to you <laughs> yeah 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 i'm like about to send it to you <laughs> Wow. Damn, dude. That guy sounds mentally ill for sure. Yeah, he must have he, he must something must have been going on with that guy. So yeah, something's going on with that guy. That's kind of cool. Aster, I would just be happy that somebody else had to deal with that guy's uh craziness. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's kind of cool, dude. Ari Ari Aster presenting Come and See. I haven't seen that movie of you. I have not. I, that's I, on my list i gotta it's one of those yeah it's one of those that's been on my list for a long time because it's it's one of those like this is three hours and therefore i haven't watched it yeah like and you know that it's just like mystery you're just gonna be watching like oh, atrocious yeah. stuff yeah apparently it's one of the most like just disturbing <clears throat> films ever uh, but like that and like lawrence of arabia i haven't seen um yeah. Oh, I've seen the, dude. You missed out on Lawrence of Arabia because they showed Lawrence of Arabia on like on seventy millimeter film. Yeah, at our school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was gorgeous. Yeah. I went to see that, and then I went to. The, I remember. I remember. I went to see that with some some chumps. I don't remember who they were. Um, and then we all we all went and like ate like fucking like baked chicken in the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> When was that? I don't remember that. I that was like third year, I would say. I wonder where I was. Probably up to some chicanery. I don't know. You were up to something because you were there. It was like the middle of the semester. Yeah. I don't know, man. I remember that there were so many screenings that I would try to get you to come with me and you would not You would not come, <laughs> <laughs> you would not come to see some movies with me. Yeah, there are certain ones, I guess. I don't know. Um, I, well, yeah, Lawrence of Arabia was like, that's like a four hour movie too, isn't it? Yeah, Holy I did shit, it, dude. I went man. and did it. Damn. Yeah, that's a lot. I gotta. That's one of those movies. It was that great. You gotta watch like a mini series, dude. Yeah, no, it was great. I loved it because they did. They did the whole like you know, let's take a break thing. Right. And I remember. I remember. I took. A, I remember we took a break, like a fifteen minute break. I went and got ice cream. <laughs> Came back, finished watching. You know, it sounds like a it nice was time. great, man. It was great. Some of the best like movie experiences I've had when we were in that school. Some of the worst ones too, but some of the best ones like. Oh yeah. You know, to this day, one of the most beautiful movies I've seen in in is the screening for aliens yeah i was gonna you know, say 70 that. millimeter streaming streaming of variance that was insane was I was, it i was aliens I was blown away. it was aliens yeah okay was. i don't know if i was there for that one but i was there for alien that was our first year yeah i think didn't they they screened like philadelphia right and then right after it was alien I think so. I know. I think I did. I know. I did, I did a double feature for that one because I watched. I think we. I think we both watched both. What yeah, we did. Yeah, I was yeah. there for Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man. They showed. Yeah, they screened. That was nice, man. I miss those the screenings, dude. That was nice. They had those every weekend. That was that was a nice thing that they did, man. Yeah, because like, we literally just show... had a movie theater on campus and they'd screen yeah. films. No, because they also did show Alien 
um, again, like the, the the print of it. And I remember that when I wa- I think I rewatched it then when they showed it too. And then I was also like, this is insane. Yeah. Like the 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 me watching Aliens and Alien on film were some of the best yeah. movie watching experiences I've ever had. Oh, One of the sure. worst ones. Mission Impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, Magnolia <laughs> too, right? Yeah. I remember yeah, you you ranted yeah. about Magnolia because someone kept laughing at the and at the, the hills movie. have eyes. Yeah, the hills have eyes. The oh, because the same guy was just laughing the, the entire the time. Same person was just laughing the whole time. Top of his lungs. Somebody, Did, yeah, yeah. I was gonna. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, somebody who who I have to this day, I just have like anger and hate for in uh, my heart. Oh, because <laughs> he ruined <laughs> he ruined Magnolia for you. Ruined Magnolia. If you're listening, you know who you are. You know who you are if you're listening. I'm not gonna name names. You yeah, know, hey, you're very professional. Oh yeah, your Facebook but posts suck too. They're yeah, but if horrible. you're listening, you know who you are. You know who you are. You ruined Magnolia. You ruined the hill house. The reels have eyes. You ruined. It. You know. Who you, you know who you are. You ruined. It. <laughs> didn't you say? I think it was the hills have eyes. Didn't someone go like, "Shut the somebody, fuck up"? Somebody said, "Shut the fuck up, dude." And then it was like really awkward after that. That's awesome. Good for yeah. them. But the Magnolia one, it was like the Magnolia. The Magnolia one, I felt it more than the Hills Have Eyes screening because the Magnolia one, again, Paul Thomas Anderson is one of my favorite filmmakers, um, and his film, and it's because his, I, you know, his films, I have a very personal um, feeling about his movies, and Magnolia. That was my first time rewatching it. When I first watched it, it moved me, but it, you know, I didn't get it. And then like, I didn't, I didn't like, get get it, you know, like I wasn't like 100% like behind it. Yeah. And then when they showed the, when they rescreened it, I was just moved, blown away. I remember just being so moved. Yeah. And then, you know, some experience in this movie, because the thing about Magnolia is it's just very melodramatic. It's just very melodramatic. Um, and again, it's like you have to be there with it, you know, because it's like, it's, if you're just, watching people express their emotions like in a very kind of like outspoken you know way i don't know what about this guy i don't know what prompted him to just go in a fit of laughter but i was just like so i just felt robbed because i was like i'm genuinely engaging with this film Mm. genuinely having like a the experience that i feel like the filmmaker intended for and you're just laughing. I mean, come on, man. If you're if you're at a movie theater and you're watching a movie that's not a comedy, get the hell out of there, man. I know. Like, come on, bro. It's not about you, man. Yeah. I remember, dude, I remember. That was like one of the angriest I've ever seen you where you came back. You came back to our dorm and you were just like, this motherfucker. He said, I was so angry. I'm going to rip off this guy's fucking arms, man. I was so angry. I couldn't believe it. That was amazing. I, couldn't believe it. I was so angry. What, a, what an ass. Yeah. Well, because I, I feel like people there would do that. It's like, are we not film fans? Do we not buy into movies anymore? Like, I know we all know how they're written and how they're made and everything, but I feel like everybody's got kind of the behind the scenes scoop these days. It's like, that's part of movie going, dude, is to like go and buy in, you know? Or at least try to buy in. You know, if the film's good, then you'll be able to successfully buy in. You know, um, yeah. No, I, I, I definitely get that because that pissed me off, man. About that school. Like, I remember we went and watched. Uh, we went to see a screening of Halloween, John Carpenter's Halloween. Oh yeah, oh, and people the, just like oh, giggling at it, man. I'm just like, what the? F-? It's not like we're wa- sitting here watching like schlock. Like we're not watching like Roger Corman films from the 80s or something it's like we're watching john Carp john carpenter's halloween man and i was getting pissed and then i remember like I remember, when I remember the, you and I, I remember that you and i didn't even finish it we we were just like fuck this whole thing well no because the film burned the like film it, burned and i was yeah. happy when it did i was like good i'm glad because people were just sitting at, oh god our year was like insufferable at that school man yeah and then i remember when like other years kind of came in below us i was like these, was these guys Oh, you thought you thought it was. I was gonna I say they were a little worse. better. Dude, it, wasn't, it wasn't worse. It got worse. It got worse. Because it, it's like, it's like it, it got worse. Because it's like everybody's, you know, these new people they were just immature. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. And then it's like when I feel like I feel like a, you know, this like it's like this distinctive feature of immaturity that it's just like unwilling to meet serious topics like at eye level. Oh yeah, you know? for sure. That's what it is because it's like. A lot for a lot of these people, it was like 
it, it, I suffered this more than you because I was going to more screenings than you. I was going to screenings like every weekend, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. So it's like, and I would be like, Jake, let's go to the screening. You wouldn't come with me. Um, <laughs> I'm calling you out, dude. Uh, <laughs> but I would go to the, all these screenings and I would have to suffer with these people because I'm there, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah. Dude, I went to a screening. I Every year that they would screen the before movies, I would go. Yeah. Because Janos would screen them every year. I went to all um, those. And I went to, I don't think you went to like the, the last one that he did. Because I, I went to I went to the before sunrise screening and those kids were just in there laughing. The whole movie just Yeah, there's nothing. What the fuck? Yeah, I know. It's like, it's stuff like that. Because here's the thing, man. Like you and I, dude, we have fun, man. Like you listen to this, people listen to this podcast. You guys know we have fun every week. Like we like to laugh, but you know, and if we're going and watching like Dumb and Dumber in screenings or like something, you know, yeah. a comedy, any comedy, and you want to laugh, like, yeah, fucking like, let's laugh. Let's have a good time. But like, dude, I don't want to go to like, like, I remember when we went to see John Carpenter's Halloween and like Michael yeah. Myers would pop like, you know, from behind a hedge and like the music would kick in and, you know, like the that creepy note would kick in and people would giggle and i'm like what the fuck is funny yeah. about that how's that that's funny what dude that's what i'm saying it's just like this like it's like this unwillingness it's like it's like you either look at the movie in the eyes you know or you blink and or you look away and it's like everybody was just like focused on like being a clown making other people laugh or just like unwilling to to commit emotionally you know yeah. it's just like then why are you here why are you in film school why are you here to sit you know it's like oh yeah you know, because it's it, you know, I know, I know that probably sounds like harsh for me to say, obviously, um, but it's like you know, I don't know, it's just ass. Because I never had, I've never had that that I've never, I've never interacted with film that way. You know, like I've always had so much respect for the the medium and the craft. And it's like you go to see something, you know, whether you know whether you're 18 when we got there, whether you're fucking 22 when you're leaving, and it's like still, it's like have some respect for the fucking you know, we're, we're watching this thing, you know? Yeah. I don't know. No, it's just not harsh at all, dude. I mean, I a hundred percent agree that that was one of those things. Again, we talked about this like a month ago, maybe on the podcast where it was like, just kind of this feeling of like, you know, continuous like alienation. Like when I got to, you know, college where I'm just like, am I, am I the only one who isn't, doesn't go to like a serious film or a scary film and like, doesn't, like fucking laugh you know like it's one thing again though it's like i don't know it's like just it's like i don't know know your audience or know your um not your audience but like uh i don't know there's like certain social cues that are like not that complicated you know it's like yeah like here's one example of when you might laugh in a horror movie when there's a big jump scare and everybody says ah and then you right, laugh you, a little you bit, laugh. but then yeah, you shut you the fuck up and you continue yeah. watching. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, aunt, dude, I, and that's funny, man. I don't remember people um, giggling during the before movies, but it's like. Oh, dude, that was, that was like that, our last year. That was our last year. Oh, our fourth year. God. That, yeah. How do you go? How do you do that? Those are such profound films with like, and it's just two people talking the and entire it, movie, and it, and it, saying and it, nothing it, funny. Like there's no, dude, there's no comedy there's like a little bit of comedic relief like anything imagine, else imagine how i imagine how i felt because again it's yeah. like by that point i was I, by that point i had watched those movies every year there were years that i watched it more than once because i there were years that i you know that you and i watched them or that you know we show them together to other people so the, every year i was watching this movie like this movie's like two or three times in a year and i was just so angry and i remember at that point i was having like weekly meetings with my professor who showed that film and I was just, I was just like, I was just like, what do you make of that? You know? Yeah. And he was just like, yeah, it's just, he was just like, it's just the maturity, you know, it's like, they're not willing to engage with the topic. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess that's what it is, you know, but it's so disappointing because it's like, it's selfishness too. Cause it's just like, well, if you're not willing to engage with this, like don't ruin it for everybody else. There's somebody yeah. in this theater who might be having like a genuine connection <clears throat> with this um yeah oh for sure yeah it's like go leave and continue to smoke pot like somewhere else you know right um yeah dude 100 percent. i mean and i think you're onto something too with like the unwillingness to engage with something serious because like let's be honest man we went to an art school college is already like <laughs> we already know kind of the yeah. the current discourse of like how 
you know, sheltered like a lot of college students are, the whole safe spaces thing, yada, yada, yada. We all, we've all heard mm-hmm. it now. Um, but art school is like that on crack. Like it's like that, the epitome of that, you know? And it really is, I, I think you're onto something with that because it's like, it really, it does feel like it's just a bunch of stoned people in a before movie right. just being like, I don't have the fucking mental capacity or the maturity to like confront you know, this story about two people, you know, being in love or like falling in love, you know what I mean? Right. Um, yeah. And I feel the same way about people. Like whenever I hear people say like, oh yeah, I can't really sit through a movie. I'm just like, yeah, I, I, I we, we don't, we can't relate, you know? Right. Cause like to me that, I don't know that that's just kind of like, really, you can't like, you can't find yourself like, yes, I know your ass is in a seat for like two hours, but it's like your yeah. mind isn't stimulated <laughs> enough to, yeah. to like engage with this, you yeah. know? Cause it's like, it's stimulating your, your brain, you know, if you let it, it yeah. can, you if know, you let but, it, yeah. But now, now it's like this, now we're, you know, at that time it was like, you know, at that time we were the Instagram generation, but now kids are on fucking TikTok, man. Yeah. And it's just like everybody, you know, Vine too was a thing, but it's like, it's like everybody just had people's like you know our our span of attention has just decreased so oh, for much. sure yeah um but yeah 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 and, and everybody- again it's like you know you and i like we just sat here talking about how much we love come down like we like to yeah. laugh i love being exactly. goofy yeah. dude i don't think life yeah. is that serious but but, that- but yeah like to uh, yeah it's just like, yeah, well, that, that's, there that's is a the time thing. and place for everything, and that was hundred yeah. percent. That was something that pissed me off about that school. Like immediately, yeah. I was like, "What the fuck's going on?" You yeah. know. And again, we found our, you know, our people eventually. But yeah. it, it was, you know, who, who, who boy, there was I, a lot of sorting. Yeah, no, to put, I guess to put a bow, a bow in this whole conversation. Um, listen, folks, we hate movies in this podcast. Don't get us wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we hate movies. We suck ass. <laughs> Fuck um, movies. But at the same time, you know, we love movies. We have a love-hate relationship with movies. Um, love movies more than most things, and I also hate them more than most things. <laughs> <laughs> so take that, take that however you want. I did. I love film. I love movies. There's nothing like just, just watching a great film. Yeah, no, dude, and and obviously this week for this podcast, um, we did that, but we're not gonna get too ahead of ourselves. But that being said, though, um, what do you think if we do recaps? Or is there anything that's burning in you that you want to talk about? Yeah, I'll just go really quick. Um, I'll kind of blow through it. I wa I rewatched um, <clears throat> Friday night. Um, this girl and I watched uh, Liar Liar. I thought that oh, was do tell. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, well, so I, I was like, hey, this is like, uh, you know, she had never seen it. So I was like, fuck, well, I'm put on Liar Liar. That, it, one, of dude, my old just, time, one of my old time favorite comfort films. Oh, yeah. Same here. Dude, that yeah. movie just gets funnier every time I watch it. Is As it expected, we were laughing our asses off. She loved it. So I was like, yes. I have seen it before? Um, no, she hadn't seen it before. So right. that, that's one of my favorite things is like showing people movies they haven't seen before, but I have. Yeah. That's an incredible movie. Yeah, like, dude, when I'm with somebody, I don't want to watch something I have not seen before. I like to vet. I like to yeah. be like, oh, I know what movie you'll really love. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah 100%. I, I don't know what that is, but I just, I get a huge kick out of like, you know, even if I'm like, this is a great film and despite not really like feeling like watching it that much, I know that like we're going to have a great time. So like I'm putting 100%. it on. That's yeah. one of my favorite things in the world is introducing what better people way, to movies. What better way to put to use having seen thousands of movies right. than by just being like, I know the perfect movie. Dude, you know yeah. Movie? That's the thing. Like, you're when you're uh, at our at our level of, like, movie watching, it's like, fuck, dude. That If there's one thing you and I can talk with people about and and recommend to people it's it's freaking movies movies um so yeah that was uh that was that was a fun time and then um uh speaking of w- introducing people to showing people great movies um i came home last week for um or this past weekend for my sister's birthday and i was with my family and uh godzilla minus one came to netflix and that's right only you my know, you know, you dad know had minus seen it color one is coming there too soon right? yeah i haven't that's seen a warrant a rewatch for me yeah 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 um 
so yeah, so I mean, we've we already talked about Godzilla minus one yeah. on on the, the um, Christmas special, but um, needless to say, like the the movie score did not decrease for me. I only uh, gained respect for this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, my entire fan, you know, my sisters, <laughs> my sisters were like shouting at the screen. They were so engaged. Yeah. Um, and my mom loved it too. My mom, like when the credits rolled, my mom was like, that was excellent. That was so yeah. amazing. Nice. Um, so yeah, it just, it, it just brings me joy, dude. As like looking back on my like eight, nine year old self or further than that, dude, like five, six years old, uh, Godzilla was what first got me into film basically. Um, loving Godzilla and no one else really understanding it or knowing anything about Godzilla. Like I was alone in that dude, my entire life to, to be here now at 26 and to be able to show an Oscar winning Godzilla film to members of your family and have them love it was like, that was just pure joy for me. Um, and then that's it for on the movie front. And then today I thought I'd bring this up, dude today. Um, Mm -hmm. I, while I was working, I started um, just playing top to bottom uh, Denzel Curry's discography. Nice, dude. You got to love the man Denzel. So good, dude. So like, you know, how much of his discography have you listened to? Most of it. You know that I went through his discography when I was at the D's. Um, oh, I didn't most I of remember it. that. I don't, think, I don't think I've not listened to any of his albums, honestly. Yeah. So like me, you know, you and I have shared Denzel songs and like I'm a casual. I was, before today, I've been I a only, casual I Denzel only listener. I didn't, didn't listen to 32 Zell. I listened to everything else. Okay. Is that the one that's not on streaming? That's like his oldest one, like 2015, 2014. I haven't listened to that. Oh, dude, that I li- that I listened to that one today. That one's amazing, dude. Really? Oh, so good. So I listened to his first three today. He has like other stuff that's not on streaming services that I got to go back and check out. But for now, I'm just um listening to what's on Apple Music. So mm-hmm. today. So uh, again, before this, like I was a casual Denzel listener, but I think I'm a fan now, dude. Oh, dude, I love Denzel. I I hold all his albums in really high regard. Dude, he is incredible, man. So I listened to 32 Zell, Imperial, and Taboo today. Um, Like, dude, so amazing. There's like no Mm -hmm. skips on any of these uh, songs. Like if I go to my alternative hip hop playlist, there's just this giant chunk at the bottom. Of this, all of this, his songs. this stack yeah. of Denzel songs. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, off of like 32 Zell, Lord Vader Kush was like one of my favorites off that one. And then Delusional Shown, which is the closing track, is. That's where Ultimate comes from, right? Yeah. Ultimate. Ultimate. So, Ultimate is a single, but then on this album, there's a remix with Juicy J, which is pretty good. Yeah. Um, but delusional shown the closing track is a standout for me. Incredible, like psychedelic, um, beat, just so good. And then, um, off of Imperial, I really enjoy. Um, I obviously you, Zenith. Yeah. Zenith is one that Actually, you and I played. The, yeah. Oh yeah, played the shit out of Naughty that one. Head with Rick Ross. Yeah, Naughty Head with Rick Ross. This yeah, lie. Yeah, yeah. Um. Good night's very good if tomorrow's not here. Um, and then off of Taboo, Taboo. Uh, Cash Maniac is definitely a standout. Mm. Um, I would say, let's see, Vengeance is really good too. I love Super Saiyan Superman in that one too. I Push didn't, it up. I didn't care it. for that one as much. That, really? That's one that Mad I left I got off. It. Love Mad I Got It. I didn't, Cobain. I didn't care for Sumo either off of that album I like Sumo. too much. I didn't care for that one as much. Taboo, I feel like, is the one so far out of his discography that I probably has the most skips for me, but mm. um, it's it's still great. Um, so I'm going to keep going on Denzel because I, I, I think I'm a fan now, dude. I've always been like a minor fan, but I think I'm going to be mm. like a fan fan now. I do, I do think that his best album is Melt My Eyes, See Your Future. I think that's his best album. That was the one from like two years ago, right? Yeah, that was the last one. Yeah, that one's great. I mean, you got um, Walking on that one. And then 
uh, troubles with T Pain is like so mm. great too. T Pain murders. I really that. do think that's his best one. I think that's his best one. And then a com- he accompanied it with like those like instrumental sessions. Yeah, which I think is like double it. Like all of that album, all that entire album was in my playlist. And then the instrumental versions are also all. In yeah. My well, and then he like remixed it too, didn't he? Where he like did uh, like more jazzy beats. Yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what we're talking about. But he ra- he still rapped over those, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, and then X Wing is a great song off that. Uh, X Wing is too. such a great song. Yeah, X Wing's great. Um, but that's uh, I think that's it for me. Um, oh, and just to shout out after this podcast, I'm immediately running to uh, uh, the couch and watching uh, the new season the of The Boys, season four. Yeah. So excited, man. Yeah. That's it for me. What about you, man? That's it for you. Okay, so I am still stuck. Um, I got to Kendrick Lamar, and I have not gotten. <laughs> I've not listened to a single Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> so I'm, I'm damn, stuck I was there. looking forward to that, man. No, dude, I'm stuck at Kendrick. And the funny thing is that after Kendrick, he's like Cuddy. So it's like I'm like I've put these two guys on hold. Yeah. Um. So I'll I'll, I'll be doing other driving this weekend, so I'll probably get to their discographies. Let me ask Um, you a question, dude. Are you gonna listen to Kendrick's like very first album too? Section eighty, yeah. No, he's got one before that, bro. He's got one before Section eighty. Yeah, dude. He overly dedicated from twenty ten. Oh, is that is that on streaming services? Yeah, it's on Apple. It is. Okay, yeah, no, I'll definitely listen to this. I listen to the whole thing. I, I played everything. I played a few songs from it this past week. I was curious, and um, I I didn't love what I heard, but I'll, I'll I won't taint your opinion. I, I only played like two songs, so take that yeah. with a grain of salt. Anyway, no, I'll listen to it. I'll listen to it. Um, because I I didn't know that he had an album before Section Eight Point uh, or whatever that's called dude, Section I didn't Eight. Know. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad I glad I checked you on that. No, I didn't know, dude. Um, but um, yeah, I haven't listened to anything. Um, I watched Trek, the first one. It's great. Hell yeah. It's funny. It's super entertaining. Time passes by. Soundtrack's great. Smash Mouth's is great. Um, Some nothing else to add. It's so bad. Yeah. Um, just a great movie. Great time. I had a bunch of fun watching it. Um, that's it. That's all I got. That's it, man. Let's get Shrek into the, let's is get into love. The movie. Shrek is life. Dude. It is, dude. All I have is Shrek is love. Shrek is life. Somebody <laughs> once told me. <laughs> um, all right. Well, this week's film is uh, the classic Korean revenge thriller. What was the year on this movie? 2001, 2002? 2003. 2003. Old Boy. Um, yeah, directed by Park Chan Wook, right? Yep. Um, yeah, dude. What, what 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 were your impressions after seeing this again? We've yeah, both seen um, Old Boy, so just yeah. for context, you and I have both seen Old Boy. This was a rewatch for both of us. But yeah, no. Um, 2003, co-written and directed by Park Chan Wook, Goat, um, based on the manga by the same name from the '90s by Garon Suchija. And now Buaki Minegishi. Um, yeah. Uh, for anybody, everybody who's listening to this and you haven't seen this, watch this. And then then come back here. Don't listen to this and yeah. And then watch the movie. Just go watch the movie. Like go go and watch the go and watch this movie. And then you can come back and, and maybe, you know, watch, maybe listen to us doing this whole thing. Yeah. But Oh boy. Um, yeah. I mean, what, I mean, what is there to say about that movie? Um, it's tough, man. I can jump in if you're having, if you're still collecting your thoughts, dude. No, I'm not, I'm not collecting my thought, my thoughts about it. It's one of those things where it's like you start, I mean, you start this film and it starts somewhere else completely with, you know, him holding a guy from his tie and, it's, it's profound. It's one of those this movie's movies, profound, dude. Yeah, it's one of those movies that it's like it's difficult to encapsulate because from there, you know, he's just a drunk guy and he's at the police station and they have him there and he gives you a few of his personal details. He has a daughter and he bought her a gift and it's his birthday and for some reason he was out drinking and, you know, um, the next thing you know, he's gone and then he's imprisoned in some hotel room for 
15 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, dude, you you go on about it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get off the back of your one. No, you no, you're good, man. Um, I know it's tough because it's like it's so good. You don't even know. And where I just to rewatched start. it this afternoon. Yeah. Oh, you rewatched it today already. Mm-hmm. So you watched it twice this week. No, I watched it only today. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. I th- okay. Yeah. I thought you watched it earlier. That okay. I was gonna say, damn, bro. Um, well, old boy, dude, it's a profoundly disturbing film for sure. I mean, I, I would you agree with that statement? Because this movie profoundly yeah. disturbs me. Yeah. Um, I remember my experience with this movie. Like, I watched it first year because you you recommended it because uh, based on John Wick. Yeah. And I remember I liked it at the time, but I. I was just an 18 year old and like, I just was like, Oh, there wasn't like as much action as I thought there would be in it. You know, like, and, yeah. and I can't believe I even you gave it a six when you, when we watched this, by the way, I remember to this day when I first <laughs> when watched it, when you first watched it. Yeah. Um, well, cause then we, well, we rewatched it though, like third year, I think. And then I gave mm-hmm. it an eight and, and yeah. now I upped it to a nine after this time. I, I can't even, uh, I, I must not have been in the right headspace the first time I watched it. That, that is the only yeah. excuse or I must not have been like, I must've had something on my mind. We're not, ha- we're not happy with it, dude. I remember that when we first watched it, you were not happy. And I, and I know you told me, I remember you clearly saying to me, like, you know, you were just unhappy with the fact that the movie was anticlimactic. You're like, I feel like it didn't pay off. You're like, it didn't pay off. Uh, Damn. (laughs) I can't believe I, dude, I don't know how I would, uh, yeah. 18 year old self, dude. Jesus. Fuck. Thank God we grow over the years, dude. Just Jesus. I mean, I, I, how could I even say that? I want to like go back in time and just like scream I, dude, at my I eighteen year old self. I was like shocked. I was like, "But it's old boy. What are you talking about?" <laughs> oh, dude, that's that's ridiculous. That's yeah. fucking ridiculous. Um, yeah, that, that's wild. No, but I mean, this movie is profoundly disturbing. Um, I mean, there's multiple things about this movie that are really just psychologically incredibly disturbing. I mean, I think the yeah. just the. Uh, Right off the bat, the idea of being held in solitary confinement for 15 years, 15 years. Um, is unimaginable. And not um, only that, but they exposed him to the fact that they killed his wife. Right. You know. Yeah. Because again, I rewatched this movie and, and framed like, him for it. They framed him for it because I, I remember when I was when I started watching it again, I was like, I was like, I remember that he he tries to to commit, you know, on existing himself. Yeah. And I was like, uh, in my head, I was like, what prompts this? I couldn't remember, like, what prompted him. And then I was like, oh, of course. I said that, of course, you know. I mean, the guy was going insane. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. And and I love the, um, uh, one of the things in this movie that I love, too, are the montages. This mm-hmm. movie does montage, uh, does montages like no other film. Um there's a, a few great montages in this movie. Uh, my favorite is probably at the beginning when he's in that hotel room and it starts showing the passage of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know, um, basically compares, has like that split screen with current like world events, you know, showing the passage of time um, yeah. on the TV. I really love that. And the musical score at that moment too is like really freaking excellent. It's like this dope kind of electronic soundtrack. That's just really intense and really like, you know, just gets you ready for like a crazy ass movie. Um, but yeah, like I, they do a really good job. Like Ode Sue is a really interesting character because he's just like a total piece of shit, you know, before yes. everything yeah. happens. And, and I mean, arguably after, I guess. But um, it, it's sort of, um, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. I didn't remember um, the whole like drunken scene at the beginning with him just mm-hmm. just being a degenerate and everything. And it's it's almost like Jesus. I mean, um, who knows what would have even like what what would have become of him if if none of this even happened to him? Probably not much. Uh, he probably wouldn't have, you know, uh, gotten very far anyway. But yeah obviously a horrible thing to happen uh to be in prison for 15 years and then uh in solitary and then uh then he gets released man and he goes off on a you know a quest for revenge uh, one thing that i thought was interesting to note too uh, was the different kind of clues they leave throughout the film 
you really notice like this is a movie that demands rewatch because you start to you notice watch clues. Yeah. The first clue that I noticed for the because there's a couple big twists in this movie. Mm-hmm. The ultimate twist being that um Mido, Mido is his daughter. Mido is yeah. his daughter, which is like just spine chillingly disturbing. Mm-hmm. Um and the big the first big clue that they leave for that is when he walks into the um, restaurant and they both say to each other, like, you look familiar. Do I know you yeah. from somewhere? Yeah. When that happened, dude, I, cause I watched this movie with my dad and my dad had never seen it. So again, Ooh. another instance of me you showing submitted your, you submitted your dad to old boy. I, I kind of felt bad after too. Cause I could tell it really disturbed him, but uh, it's so disturbing. <laughs> it really is so disturbing, dude. Um, but it's like so excellently done. And, uh, when that happened, it was all I could do not to just like palm my face and just be like, Oh fuck. It's right there, man. They yeah. st- it's but right you can't there. See it, dude. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's so funny. Cause that twist is so shocking. And, and, and yet when you've rewatched the movie, it seems so obvious. Mm-hmm. Or like when you're rewatching, when you know the twist, it seems like it's right there especially, in front of you. Especially because he he plays it all off. Because the next sentence that he has is that he goes like, "Oh, you were in television, you know, because you're a chef with like cold hands and whatever." And he's like, "Oh, I recognize you from there." So he he kind of like makes it so that you go like, "Oh, I guess he recognizes him from the television, her from the television." But it's interesting though, because the 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 other clue that they have is that you know when he. When you know, after he passes out and she takes him him to her apartment, and she does that whole like analogy about like ants and about how lonely people like yeah. imagine ants and stuff like that. Then the next thing is that they cut to somebody informing about like you know she goes to try to find out about his daughter. She herself goes right. And so the next cut is just from outside of this like place, this venue, and the person's just going like, oh, his daughter, this, that, and the other thing. You know, then the next cut after that is just her again. Right. So you're like, oh, in terms of like film language, you know, they cut from, you know, all that Sue and Mido and, and, and Mido lying down to Mido being told about his daughter, you know, and it's like, yeah. oh, because this is his daughter. Yeah, <laughs> you know? dude, that's a great point. I, and I didn't even pick up on that, but you're right, because yeah. I can picture the cut. Because at yeah. first, I remember that cut, too, because at first it's her, from her POV and I thought it was mm-hmm. Ode Sue standing mm-hmm. in there and, and then it cuts to her yeah that's wild man because it's almost like as you as you say that it i thought of this analogy it's like it's almost like a where's waldo page mm-hmm. when the twist happens you it's like seeing waldo and you're like how the fuck did i not see him before <laughs> you know what i mean right. like it's right. it's so and that's how a great twist is where you're like how did i not see this <laughs> you know and and like yeah, man, I, I, dude, the whole movie too. I could have. I was just waiting for my dad to be like, "There, I know." <laughs> yeah. That's is is that his daughter? You know, but I, I think it's it. The movie, it's well, it, the, you know, they, the filmmakers this, this, almost have like this magical ability yeah. to place it just under your nose to where it's like so well, close, dude. It's because they they always like bury it. You know, yeah. like, like, again, like when you said, you know, when they re- say they recognize each other, the next line from all that Sue is like, oh, I saw you on TV. Yeah. And then you go like, okay, that's the explanation. And then, you know, the next thing that happens is again, from her POV, they cut to being like, oh, where's his daughter? This is his daughter. And then they showed Mito again. But then the next scene is Mito saying to him, hey, your daughter is going by this name and she lives in this address. Yeah. So then as an audience member, you go like, oh, you know, there's his daughter. You know, like right. he knows where she is. And then all that who just goes like, I'm going to go see my daughter after I exact my revenge. Right. So again, the movie like buries it. And then you're like, oh, OK, I guess we know he just doesn't care to go and, and see her, you know. Exactly. So, and there's also like red that, herrings, too. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like because of that, it's such like a clever thing where they basically like keep hinting at it through the movie, but they keep giving the audience like an answer. I mean, like, oh, maybe, yeah. maybe it's this, you know. Don't yep. question it, you know. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, a bit of, I guess, a bit of like, right, almost like writer's workshop here. Like, I, I thought it was, I think it's interesting because I do think that that's one of the, because like, again, writing is, it's an art, but it's also a game of ones and twos at times. There's right. like kind of a mathematic. There's like some mathematics to it, and right. I do think that like 
a key aspect of building like a great twist like that the one part of it is having proper build up to where the twist doesn't come out of nowhere and they're set up but I think mm-hmm. another key ingredient is red herrings, mm. the the presence of red herrings, because I I had an experience with this. I wrote um, a short story, a horror short story, a long time ago. Um, I want to say it was like seven years ago now. And I recently rewrote it, actually, mm-hmm. like a few months ago. Um, and I actually want to like try to get it submit it for publication um but the initial version of the story that i wrote back in like 2017 some people did there's a big twist at the end and some people didn't see it coming but a lot of people said like oh i knew i saw it coming right because it ended up getting like um readings done for it on youtube um so you could see in the comments like feedback you know people saying like oh i knew this was going to happen i knew it was going to happen on page one or whatever and it it's because it didn't in hindsight it's because it had no red herrings there was like no mm. other possible twist there's no other alternative where yeah. so in the new version of the story i made sure to have two major red herrings two major possibilities and then the twist comes and it's like this third possibility that no that you weren't really thinking of and everybody that i've had read the new one like you know, multiple beta readers and an editor that I had to take a look at it and and proofread it for me. Um, all of them, every single last one of them were shocked by the ending. They, they were like, Oh, I didn't see it coming. I thought either a or B was going to happen. I did not see C coming. And Mm -hmm. so red herrings are massively important in a mystery film. If, if there's a big twist. Right. And so this movie has a lot of the, it has those, like it has small ones like that. You just mentioned where it buries it, but it also has like other things that you're focused on. Cause you're more, you're not, your mind's not focused on that. Your mind mm-hmm. doesn't even really go there. Like who is this woman? It's kind of like, mm-hmm. well, this is just a supporting character. The mm-hmm. real questions you're asking the whole movie is who like is the guy. Wh- and why did he put him there? Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's the big red herring. Right. And then, Even so, when you kind of find out some more stuff, then it's like, well, you know, like what happened to his sister? You know, like what Mm. what ended up? What did Ode Sue do? Right. Right, And so you're still like not thinking um, your mind's just not going there. And what I found amazing about this movie, too, is it's like it's a revenge film, but it's like it's like a double revenge film. It's like, you know, yeah, it's, it's really about the revenge. villain's yeah. revenge on Ode yeah. Sue, not about Ode Sue's revenge on, revenge the, villain. on the villain. Yeah. yeah. And what I found fascinating about, like about this movie is that they both really wronged each other horribly and they both and regretted it. And they both exacted revenge on each other and regretted it. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause I mean, Ode Sue got his revenge in a way the guy, you know, offed himself yeah. with the guy yeah. you know he, he um you know i would still say i i would say uh what's the guy's name the villain G-Wun? is that is that g Wu? is that his name G- yeah g uh ju win lee woo jin woo jin lee woo jin lee i would say lee woo jin probably wins that round but like you know like jesus yeah. christ but uh holy shit like holy shit but um i i i i, I love this movie man because this is one of those movies where and it, it feels distinctively like it feels distinctively like um korean yeah um and that you know i, I i've i always had like an affinity and love particularly for you know these foreign films um japanese and korean cinema yeah um Same. over over western film a lot of the time yeah because their sensibilities are just completely somewhere else and their interests are completely somewhere else and they they always seem to be fascinated with intricacies and small details more so than like a big picture you know like you know here it is you know execution um and i've always loved that, that about them there's a guy named um imaishi i forget his first name or his last name um but he's the guy that made a show called um tenken topa gurin lagan an anime and he's somebody whom I always keep this quote of his in my head where he somebody asks him, like, what's the philosophy, of, you know, that you have about like behind making the works that you do? And he was like, well, you know, he was like, you know, here in, in Japan, we're more interested in interesting shapes is what he said. Mm-hmm. And he was like, and the, what I've observed is as a Western 
world is more interested in perfect shapes. And I really love that, like his kind of like watering down of like different like Western and Asian philosophies when it comes to like art and filmmaking. Um, I remember you talking about this first year, I think. Yeah, because yeah. I've always seen like American filmmaking that way. Of it's like, oh, this is a guy trying to make a perfect circle. Right. And I've always seen like Asian filmmaking in that sense of like, this is somebody who's just trying to make a really fascinating piece, yeah. you know, with a lot of little swirls, you know. It might not be the perfect circle, but it's an interesting, you know, um, impressionistic piece. Yeah. That's how I feel about this movie, because it's like, this is literally a movie about a guy whom... In Oda Esu, whom he was just this very unremarkable, unremarkable guy. All that his name says is, you know, live each day quietly, you know. And that was the, you know, his 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 cardinal sin is that he did not obey. <laughs> he did not live by his name. Right. You know, he was causing too much ruckus, like too much of a, too much ruckus, you know, looking for trouble, looking for trouble since he was a kid. And it's like, you know, with him and that and that girl, like what business did he have? following that girl you know he didn't have any business and then he's like spying on her you know and then he tells his friend that's like the you know the biggest gossip in town yeah 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 and he ruins these people's lives you know um and it's like uh, it's like you know you and, and the fascinating thing about it again is that it's like it's such an innocuous thing so much so that he didn't even remember it but that's the that was the thing that reverberated to such an extent that it met him in the present time. You know, it's like what it's like what um Li Wu Jin says. He's like, you know, whether it's a grain of sand or a rock, you know, still gonna sink, you know. And it's like you might have the only thing that you might have done here was I guess follow my sister, watch us, and then tell your friend, you know, such an insignificant thing that he didn't even remember. He thought Wu Jin erased it from his memory. He just didn't fucking remember. Right. And you know, and it's like such an insignificant thing yet you know look at the amount of repercussions that came from that um and i love that that's fascinating you know because again in an american movie it would be like oh the villain did the most atrocious you know it it must have it it would have been like the most atrocious thing that somebody would have had to do to cause somebody else to do some shit like this Mm -hmm. and it's like no he just it was just a fucking tattletale he was just a guy that was just didn't keep quiet and i feel like his name also kind of embodies the fact that it's like Again, it's like when Mido says to him, like, hey, look, you know, you, in your head, you've been saying that you've been living in a bigger prison because even though you're free, you don't know why you were in prison to begin with. And this, begin with, this is haunting you. You know, you have the answers now. You know, you know why this guy did this to you. You know what you did. You know, mm-hmm. you caused his sister to to die, you know. And you cost him great suffering and, and trauma, you know. And it's like, you did this to this guy. You know why you were imprisoned. And for all that, so it's like, well, no, I still have to get my revenge. And it's like, for what, man? You know, for what? You know, and again, it's just like, if, if you look, if, if, if he stopped, he was like, I have a woman that I love. I understand why this guy did this to me, you know. And you know the guy has a fucking medical condition; he's gonna die anyway. Yeah. And it's like, what's like, what, what is, what, like, what is there to gain from you other than just literal violence? Um, yeah. And I feel like that's the message of this film because it's it's true for all that Sue and it's true for Li Wu Jin, where it's like, what's at the end of this for either of you guys is just complete and utter destruction, you know complete and utter destruction. I feel like this is what this movie is actually trying to say too, that it's just like in the pursuit of revenge, you destroy yourself and the the object of your revenge, you know. Oh, for sure. After all was said and done, Lee Woo Jin couldn't live with himself anymore, you know, because all that he was left with was torment and anguish and frustration. And for Oda Esu, it was literally the exact same thing. Yeah. You know, so it's like, what did you gain? So much so that his character had to go out of his way and be like, for in order for me to continue to live, I need to forget. <laughs> I need to forget everything. Right. You know? 
Um, but that grim, judging by that grimace on his face in the last like two seconds, it's like there's yeah. there's a part of him that knows still. Yeah, you know, it's like it, something's fucked up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I want to get to the ending in a second, like you know that ending. Um, yeah, and and you're right about the revenge the revenge angle because it's um, what's interesting is like yeah, Li Wu Jin he enjoys his revenge for like ten seconds. For like 10 seconds <laughs> it's like you know seconds and then then yeah. he's just back in pain feeling worse and and you know it's funny because i read um about like the evolutionary psychology of revenge and like the utility of it and it was sort of um you know the the hypothesis is that you know we evolved that desire to sort of as a way as like a built-in mechanism in tribes to sort of keep people in line right so it's mm-hmm. like hey you know you steal my shit or you wrong me i'm gonna wrong you back so you know like that that keeps people in line right or at least gives people so it keeps some people in line at least has puts consequences like on the table um but when you get revenge generally you feel worse after um they've right. done studies on that and it's because yeah like that you know of course because that mechanism evolved in us not to make you feel good it's it's a you it's it's a utility to keep people in line but it's not designed to make you feel good after you've done it um after you've taken revenge right so right. um i thought they encapsulated that re- the psychology of revenge i don't know if there's a movie that that really explores the psychology of revenge better than this one actually to be honest with you i i wouldn't i i, I couldn't tell you i can't yeah um, i mean there's a lot of great revenge films out there Revenge is is a common theme in in a lot of storytelling. Even if it's not a quote unquote revenge story, it still presents yeah. itself itself in a lot of stories. Yeah. Um, like a good chunk of stories, I would say, have some theme of revenge woven in there somewhere. Um, yeah, man. Uh, what, dude? I want to talk about the twist too, like the big twist, the big reveal that um, mm-hmm. Mido is his daughter. Mido, Mido, mm-hmm. Mido, Mido. Um, I just, dude, like when he opens that box and is going through the photos, and the first photos you see are her as a baby. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like it is appalling, dude. It's it's sickening when you see her there as a baby and you realize like whole, holy he, fucking he shit. Destroyed, he destroyed him psychologically. <laughs> Lee would him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Destroyed Odesu, dude. Especially because Odesu, like when they get in the elevator, he's like, Oh, you and your sister, you know, he's like just saying that to him Yeah. and trying to play like armchair psychologist. And it's like, this is going to blow up in your face, bro. Oh, yeah. I thought it was interesting too, though, that Lee Woo Jin, um, he decided not to show uh, Mido what was in the yeah. box. Cause I think at that point I, he was like, yeah, I think I got my revenge. And I, I, I think, well, I think at that point it was almost like, it was almost like having dinner and not being hungry for dessert. Like he was probably well, just think, already think, sickened with himself at that point. I think Lee Woo Jin is an, is, he's fascinating because he, he, this is what I think. I think that he was never going to show Mido those photos. Like that's my interpretation of his character. Yeah, yeah. Because you have to remember that Lee Woo Jin, and he says this a lot. He's, Lee Woo Jin has a weird relationship with Odai Su because it seems like he he finds Dai Su like a kindred spirit. Because obviously Dai Su and him have done a lot of the same things. Um, and his entire existence is tied to Daesu. Mm-hmm. But also the fact that he basically had been kind of like um, protecting and raising Mido, which he says to Odaesu, like, I, you know, he goes like, I protected her, you know. Yeah. Since he was a kid. So I his plan her. would have You know, he was like, I was the one who got that dude's hand caught off. You know, because he, he like, you know, assaulted her, you know, it's like me, you know. So I think he understood in a way 
that despite it all that was happening, Lito was innocent. Yeah. Yeah. I think he knew that. And I think he, I think the only reason why the, you know, it escalated to that point was because he wanted, he wanted Daisu to humiliate himself. And he knew that if he hadn't, if he didn't have that like card, Daisu was just going to try to kill him. Right. You know, which is what Daisu was trying to do. Um, yeah. I don't think he was, I don't think he was actually going to, show her that information you know i think yeah i think you're right actually i didn't even i I didn't really think of that possibility um yeah i i think that's a solid reading dude yeah exactly because he knew and he knew he it would further torment odesu just the possibility of that happening the suspense his daughter and it's it's fascinating you know when you like you said when you rewatch this movie there's scenes in which he acts like fatherly towards her you know, he even tells her, like, pray that you meet, you know, a younger man. Like, he, right, right. He has this, like, fatherly, like, uh, like interactions with her. And, you know, even when he talks on the phone after the fact that he knows. He's a sweet to her, Like a dad. Yeah. yeah. I noticed that, and too. Yeah. it's fascinating. It's interesting, too, that before he leaves to get his revenge, um, Mito says to him, you know, like, I hope that, that all that Sue can make Lee Woojin kneel in front of him. Yeah. And that's exactly like what Lee Woojin did to a whole that Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought of that too. When she said that, I was like, oh shit. Because then I remember like him barking like a dog, you know, and I was like, fuck. Do you remember your reaction when you first saw this twist? Like, how old were you? What was the context? Like, what, what was your reaction, man? Dude, I... <sighs> This movie was devastating because, yeah. you know, I mean, he cut, I mean, the fact that he cuts off his tongue to me was like also very just visceral. Yeah. Um, I don't know how old I was. I think I might have been like 16, I want to say, when I watched this. Yeah. Um, because I watched it before going to film school, maybe 15, no, maybe like 16, 17 ish. But I didn't see it coming. You know, I was completely shocked. And I was disgusted, yeah. you know, and I just didn't, I was just like, this is insane. Yeah. 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 And yeah, again, it horrifying. was, I just had a, I, and I had a visceral reaction because I had never seen a movie or any piece of art or medium before where the main characters completely defeated and humiliated mm. like that. It was shocking. You know, I was shocked. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish I could. Rem- I, I wish I could remember how I felt when I saw that twist um, for the first time. I, I can't, but yeah, I it, honestly it, it doesn't even matter because like seeing it again just in real time and and experiencing the full film it's in its entirety, yeah, building up to it and seeing it again and and and, and I think part of it too is just being there with someone who's experiencing it for the first time as well. Um, it, it's it was like watching it for the first time again. Um, yeah, this this movie gets under your skin for sure. But I, I guess, yeah, I, I want to say too, I mean, just moving away from the story, I mean, just on a technical level too. Um, I love, like, I mentioned the montages. I think this movie has some of the best montages. Um, I, uh, I love a lot of the different psychedelic visuals. The scene with the ant on the train. I really like, I thought that was an interesting creative decision. Um, I wouldn't be again. I know it's like, I I know it's like take a shot every time Jake mentions breaking bad, better call Saul or Hannibal. (laughs) But I, I, I I will say that I do think uh, I would not be surprised if Hannibal was highly influenced by this film visually, Mm -hmm. Um, which where do you think? I feel like this film could, because I know Hannibal was very influenced by David Lynch do you think Old Boy was influenced by uh, Park Chan Wolk was influenced by David Lynch, particularly like with the ant scene? I was like, this is like a David Lynch thing. I don't know. I don't know because I also don't know like where the manga ends and, and Park begins. Yeah, I haven't read the manga for this, so I don't know exactly like where things are extrapolated from. That's true. Um, but I wouldn't rule it off. Obviously, Lynch is a huge, very hugely influential filmmaker. Yeah. I, I don't, but I don't know. That's the answer is I, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Um, what's your, uh, I guess to cap it off, like what's your, um, interpretation of the ending? Like the very end of like, of the very end. Yeah. Like when he uh, Um, gets hypnotized and then hugs his daughter. 
dude that's like so it's such it's so difficult because it's like what do you make of that um it's very ambiguous i feel like because you know like 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 i said before because ultimately i i you know to me ultimately the film really is just just about like the the um how pointless how pointless revenge is mm -hmm. you know um but in terms of the ending is so ambiguous because also when the movie goes into the credit sequence you see them like standing looking into the horizon yeah and then the credits roll um my interpretation of the ending is that he actually did lose the memories of what happened but that despite that you know he is just a broken human being you know because mm -hmm. it's like you know you see him smile that he's happy and this girl's with him but at the same time it's like even if he forgot the specifics of what happened he still remembers that he was in jail for 15 years mm -hmm. and that lee Wu jean killed his wife you know and that his daughter estranged and that his best friend died like i feel like he's still i feel like part i feel like he's still haunted by trauma and sadness and misery even if one element of all of that is this is not necessarily in his head anymore, if that makes any sense. Yeah. No, no, definitely. Like I still think he's a broken human being, even if he doesn't remember like the most traumatic event of all of it all, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Cause it's like, you know, yeah, despite losing your memories, your, your mind is still, <laughs> you know, just broken from all of those, um, yeah, and I feel like there's also something to be said about like the trauma that he experienced still lingering within him, even if he doesn't remember like what causes such sadness. Right, because your mind yeah. has been altered at that point. Um, yeah, you're not just gonna like snap into you know <laughs> like joy. Um, yeah, despite the losing the memories. Uh, my interpretation too, like I feel like on a th there's a thematic. Uh, obviously there's always a thematic something thematic going on in any ending but or any good ending or half decent ending um i think what i found interesting one word came to my mind when i was watching the ending of this uh film and it was the word impossibility mm -hmm. and it was what i mean by that is the impossibility of this situation it's like because i'm watching this movie and i'm like Okay, so you got rid of your memories, and now you're here with this woman who you don't know is your daughter, and I'm assuming mm. that since you've lost your memories and she doesn't know, that you're going to proceed to have some kind of non-platonic relationship with her moving forward, mm -hmm. and that is, you know... That sucks because it's like, well, yeah, I mean, what you don't know can't hurt you, but still, that's completely fucked. Mm -hmm. But it's like, also, it's an impossible situation because then if you have your memories, well, you can't change what happened, you know? So it's mm -hmm. like, there's an impossibility there. It's a completely impossible situation to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I guess that's just kind of like, maybe the movie is just trying to say like, this is where, you know, debauchery and revenge kind of get you, you know, right. because even before right. the whole revenge thing, like Ode Sue was just a, you know, a, 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 a degenerate, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, that's kind of, I didn't mean to sound pretentious there. Like one word possibility, but like, you know, that it's just, I'm just being honest. No, like I, that was I get, I get, I get totally what, what to say. yeah, it was what came to my mind. Um, yeah, no, I get the meaning of the words. Though. I get what you're talking about. Yeah. So I will, I'm, I'm going to say, too, on a lighter note here, <laughs> I watched, I was curious, so I watched a couple clips from Spike Lee's version. <laughs> Dude, yeah. like, I watched the scene where he finds out the big twist, and I'm like, this is so bad. Dude, it's like, it, 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 it comes off like a parody. It comes off like a parody, dude. Should be should stay in like filmmaking jail forever. I feel like the only reason I feel like the only reason why he's been able to have good graces since then is because obviously he's made classic films do the right thing, obviously. Yeah. But it's like, bro, my God. Like 
doing remaking old boy and uh, remaking old boy period almost nullifies all the good that he ever did yeah <laughs> it's like he's said neutral yeah yeah I mean, yeah, and like, what new could you even bring to this movie? It's like if you're gonna remake this for uh for uh, an American market, just do a fucking shot for shot, scene for scene remake with great actors. You know, there's nothing you can add to this. There's nothing that yeah. needs to be added. Like if you just must, Haneke. Yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Which Haneke did great with that with Funny Games. Like, Funny games. you know, it was just he just needed to bring it over to to a, a an American market because that was the country yeah. that needed that movie the most, by the way, um, and still does. But I digress. Yeah, dude, that that scene. I was watching it, and I'm like, this feels like a. <laughs> you look disgusted. <laughs> I mean, dude, that scene came across. It felt like an SNL parody of Old Boy. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, the guy from District Nine is the villain. Yeah, he, he looks is like the a villain. complete it's, goof. It's so stupid. And Josh man. Brolin going like he's like hugging his face and just going like. Josh Brolin wasn't up for the task. Holy shit! Which you know, for for Minchik Soy, like this is this is a performance of a lifetime. Oh man, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Minchik Minchik Soy. This, I mean, this for him, this is a performance of a lifetime. Yeah. I mean, this movie for me, this movie has always made it so that I regard him as like one of the greatest actors of all time, just because of this movie, the range of of emotion and nuances that he goes through, especially at the end when he's just like oh, yeah. pleading and going from anger to to trying to negotiate with him to just like pleading, licking his yeah. fucking shoes. I mean, my god, dude. Yeah, I love that but, scene, dude, where he he goes through like all these different. He's like exploring every angle. That he possibly can to like try bargaining to get. Bargaining and yeah. yeah, it's like yeah. At first he's barg begging, then he bargains, then he's like, "I'll fucking kill you, I'll chew you yeah. up, there'll be nothing left of you." And then he's like, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please, uh, I'll be, you know, I'll be your Lord. servant." Yeah, yeah like yeah. it's like, oh, dude. That, but again, but, dude, but it, I feel like what that scene communicates to is like he, he's not like really sorry, you know. He's just he's just wants an outcome, you know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Anyway, and I, I think I think that's why when he just cuts off his tongue and he like mutilates himself like that, I I feel like that's why for Lee Wood for um Lee Wood Jean I feel like that's when he's like okay I got you know I got what I wanted out of this yeah thing. yeah for yeah. sure yeah 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 the scene where I remember when I first watched this too where the camera kind of um tilts up to Lee Woo Jin and he's got his face buried in that cloth and at first I remember mm. when I first watched it I was like is he crying and he's then it, and then it was like he was laughing and I was like huh yeah. I, I I bet that was intentional though um yeah but uh anyway we we could go on on and on but honestly I, I oh, yeah, I'm gonna cap it off with this like I think that or at least my portion of this the review with this like I watched this movie. This is one of those movies that's like so great that it kind of depresses me a little bit because yeah. the old boy is a great example of the kinds of things that I want to write as an artist. Like I want to mm -hmm. write, you know, gritty kind of um, stories. There's a few genres that I really love. Um, and one of them that I really love are revenge thrillers. And, and I just feel like, old boy has almost in my mind like nullified the revenge thriller and made it kind of pointless to like make yeah. it more because it's like how do it's you kinda, fucking out ended, that it kind of ended the genre because <laughs> yeah because yeah. it's like all right i guess we can keep making like just regular ass revenge thrillers where it's like somebody you know just takes a gun and wants to and there's no like big twists or whatever mm. but yeah like as far as like elaborate revenge schemes with twists and turns and a big like reveal, I don't know yeah. how you beat this. I don't know. Is it, also, is it possible? I don't know. And we'll also, see. And also just in terms of execution in the philosophical context, content of the content of the film. Yeah. The filmmaking craft. Yeah. The scenes, just the payoffs, the visual references, like, you know, when he fucking when Lee Woo Jin's talking at him or looking at himself in the mirror, and then they fucking do a snap soon on fucking yeah. um all that soon. Like everything in this yeah. movie, you know, it's so purposeful. Um for my for my money, you know, I've seen this movie now I think five times, five, six times. Perfect film. Yeah. 
Um, 10 out of 10. No, I have nothing but love and praise. Parshan Wok is one of my favorite filmmakers. He's the only filmmaker which I've seen. He's the only filmmaker whose movies I've given 10 out of 10 to two, three times. I have three of his films I've given 10 out of 10 to. This movie he has called Thirst, well, Vampires, and then this movie that he has called The Handmaiden. I'm giving the in this movie three 10 out of 10s. Wow. The, the other two runner ups, Paul Thomas Anderson and um, Hideaki Anu. And they have each of them have two movies that are given 10 out of 10 twos. So I love Parsh and Walk. Love him. Um, if you're listening to this and you're at this point of this podcast, go watch Old Boy. Even if you already heard us spoil it, just go watch. Yeah, you'll you'll still love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, yeah. What uh, what you got for us next week, man? Next week, and you what what, is, what rating are you sitting on for this movie on your third watch? Oh, nine out of ten, man. Strong nine. I I Dude, couldn't you even watch it again tonight. Give it a four. <laughs> I could give it a ten. Um, I don't. Yeah. It, honestly, I could interchange it between a nine and a ten. Nine or a ten. There's something I don't. Just for the sake of time, I won't get into it. But I think there's a few. There's like something here, which again, it's it's specific, but. I, I we're kind of like it's going to open up another can of worms and I think yeah. we just got to end it for now but um there's like one reason maybe I wouldn't give it a, like a 10 out of 10 it's not anything specific the film does it's sort of like mm-hmm. by design of the film um I get it. but I, I could easily give it a 10 out of 10 as well so I don't know I, I'm very yeah. stingy with 10 out of 10, so, and I know you are too, so I, yeah, I, I respect I your 10 out of 10. You know I Believe yeah, me, yeah. I know how big of a deal that is that you've given it a 10 out of 10 because yeah. you're, you're just as stingy as I am with the, with the 10 out of 10 score. So yeah. I've, given, I've given 10 out of 10s to like 20 plus-ish movies, I think. Yeah, you same know, here. Out of thousands of movies that I've seen. Same, um, yeah, yeah. You, you know I love all boy, dude. Yeah, we're, um, we're stingy with those dimes, dude. But that being said... Everybody, join us next week as we go back to a filmmaker that we've seen quite a few movies of, a filmmaker that I've given 10 out of 10s to, um, Richard Linklater. Let's watch, hit, let's watch Hitman um, on Netflix. Okay. All right, man. I don't know if it's I've heard of this one, so I, I got to check this movie, out. Brand new movie, 2024 movie. Oh. Glenn Powell is the actor. Um, it's called Hitman. It just got released on Netflix on May 24th. Um, oh, no shit. Let's do it. Oh, Do this it, is dude. Richard Linklater. Okay, I did see yeah. advertisements for this. Dude, I'm 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 pumped. Holy shit. Let's do it. Dude, Hit let's man. do it. Next week, everybody. I'm gonna go watch the boys. Alright, dude. Dude, have fun. Next time on Film <laughs> Tangents. We're out. See ya. <laughs>